morning. Uh, this is Billy Ledoux, the program manager for the State Tribal Economic Development Commission. Just want to welcome you to our uh, quarterly meeting. Uh, we have a microphone system here uh, in the room, so we ask that you keep it on mute uh, until you need to speak. So maybe raise your hand or just uh, let me know uh, through the chat if you need to, uh, if you want to say something. So good morning, everybody. Um, we'll start the State Trail Economic Development Commission meeting now. I'll just turn it over to Chairwoman Shelley Fiance. Good morning, everyone. We'll call this meeting to order. We'll call our State Tribal Economic Development Commission meeting for February 16, 2022 to order. The Montana Department of Commerce records the meetings electronically and will serve as the official meeting minutes. Please help the public by identifying yourself when you speak and explain any acronyms that may be used in the discussion. If you're referring to a document, state the document name. As a final reminder, the recording will not be edited, cut, or altered in any manner. So with that, we'll proceed with roll call. Shelley? Thank you, Shelley. <clears throat> All right, we will do roll call. Uh, Cheryl Rivas? Oh, here? <sighs> Richard Sangri. Shelly Science. Here. Rainy Walls. Here. Uh, Delina Cut the Rope. Good morning, here. Hi, this is Cheryl. Uh, I'm do here. We have Cheryl Pam. I'm sorry, this is Cheryl. I didn't Cheryl. Get... <laughs> I'm here. Oh, great. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Do we have uh, Gerald Gray on the line? Nope. Uh, Misty Cool. Uh, Osterman. Here. All right. That constitutes a quorum. Okay. With that, I am going to ask Velda Shelby if she could lead us in prayer this morning, please. Oh, oh, so can cut the, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning to everybody. Um, I'm going to pray in my language. Oh, so can I send me a key? No pick a no pick a nin pick no pick a madness. I'm a tick some key so go almost copy a smuckinix a key scaly who a key switch mo. Um, I'm asking for blessings for all of our people so that we have a good road. And I'm asking that we bring our minds together and have good hearts to make some solid decisions here for our future generations. And that everybody stay safe in the um, virus, whatever is affecting us, um, subsides and leaves our, our earth. And that the snow, this blanket, oh man, blanket, Aklu, protects us and regenerates our earth for the, the coming years. And we're just asking for a good road for everybody. Hey, hey, that's all I have. Thank you, Velda. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guests to the uh, meeting. Uh, first, we'll start with public comment on non-agenda items. Is there any public comment on non-agenda items? Okay, if not, we'll go to the approval of the 11-17-2021 conference call minutes and action items. This in our packet.
Madam Chair, this just was a very short meeting. I'll make a motion to approve minutes. Oh, for 21. Okay, we have a motion by Richard to approve the minutes. Our second. This is Gerald. I'll second. A second by Gerald. Question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, motion carries. Okay, with that, we have introductions. We'll go to Director of Commerce, Scott Osterman. Thank you, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Carol College for, uh, and to John, unfortunately, he's not here right now, but um, for hosting us. Uh, this was, I, I saw this room here some you know, some months ago, and um, John offered us, if you ever have a meeting or need a meeting or something like that, that you'd like to have a great view and and a wonderful setting, uh, you know, he offered it up, and I want to say thank you to Carol for that and uh, for the opportunity for us to meet. You know, we have a lot of challenges. We're still still fighting the pandemic. There are very, very many different, um, you know, opinions and or uh, opportunities uh, to be able to pursue through this. But I think what's most important is we stay focused on uh, the individual development in each one of the tribal communities and the collective uh, opportunity that we have to be able to speak with one voice. Uh, as legislative session is coming up and, and to start really setting priorities. And, you know, this is something that's, uh, I think, difficult because there are so many needs. Um, but I think we have to sort of, you know, put them in order and pick one. And they may be different for each, uh, uh, for each tribe, but I think it is really important to look at, let, let's just pick one and, and for each one. And, um, and collectively, we'll see where the synergies are. And, you know, as I've, I've been here a year, and I've spent, you know, I spent four, I've, I spent 40 years in private sector, and um, during that time, the half first half of my career was sort of spent creating market for products that people in, in technologies that people didn't even understand existed. Uh, in, in the middle of my career, I, I spent a lot of time strategically visioning. We were working on 25 to 30 year um, time scale to be able to say what, what's going to shift in technology. And, you know, we knew things like this were going to be existing and actually had some technology um, that, um, you know, people, let's just put it this way, we had these things with email and everything in the early 90s, but no one even knew they existed. Um, and what they were going to do. And then the last part of my career was spent doing turnarounds and looking at the present as well as the past as to how we got there and how we create a future. And, um, you know, I, I like in a lot of what we're doing here uh, to, to the, many of those types of experiences. If we have to do something new, we have to fix as much as we can from the past and understand how we got here. Uh, be respectful of, of many things, but also be innovative and, and think about how do we do something different so that we can, um, you know, make an impact. And if that is to make an impact, my encouragement to be it is to be pick one thing, you know, whatever that is, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's um, whatever it might be with, within each uh, entity that allows us at, at um in an economic development group to um, to focus and to help focus our activity as well, because we to be scattered will not help help us make you know help help you. And um, I also think that you know there's no one great one size fits all solution for anything either. And so we need to dig into that and and work hard to do that. And I'm I'm committing our our department and our opportunity to to continue to support. Um, Indian economic development 
but also to look at it with a very focused lens uh, as opposed to just a generalized, we've got to do this and we've got to do that. Let's really focus on, on how to make a difference. You know, like I said, pick one and uh, let us help uh, bring to bear whatever resources we have to be able to do that for each tribal entity. And then collectively, our uh, rising tribe lifts all boats. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I appreciate your uh, uh, your contributions to the state, and and also now so that John has uh, um, come. Thank you very much for hosting us and for allowing us to be here. This is a, a great opportunity to to be here, and the view is unparalleled in Helena. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Osterman. Um, with that, we have uh, Carroll College President John Seck. Join us, so if you could say a few words. Hold it down while I talk. Okay. Absolutely, and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here, and, and welcome to uh, Carroll College. Uh, this, is, uh, this is your home, and, and uh, we would love to have you here anytime. Uh, just let me know, uh, because this is a, a fantastic opportunity uh, uh, together to share ideas uh, and to hopefully build bridges for future partnerships. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to welcome you, and uh, and I'm also excited just to share uh, uh, just a bit about Carroll College and and uh, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, with our tribal brothers and sisters uh, across the state. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe I'll be coming back and joining you for lunch and looking forward to that as well. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, a college president doesn't, uh, doesn't get the microphone without uh, just sharing a, a few accolades about his or her college. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, do that today because uh, uh, I think it's a reflection of the faculty and staff and uh, uh, and our students, and just the, the commitment to excellence that we have here at Carroll. Uh, we learned in September that uh, uh, we were um, ranked by U.S. News & World Report as the number one uh, regional college in the western 15 states for 11 consecutive years. And uh, what's exciting is uh, uh, in any category, uh, the only other institution of higher education in America to have that designation for 11 consecutive years is Princeton University. So um, we feel we're in, in good company and, and right here in Helena, Montana. And um, Carol, our, our foundation, everything that we do is based uh, around the liberal arts. So our students are great communicators, they're critical thinkers, they're problem solvers. Um, they work well in teams, and uh, and they can show and display empathy, uh, which uh, is 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 very well received. And I, and I think, you know, our um, our students go on to do great things. We have a 25 year uh, track record of 85 plus percent acceptance rate into medical school. Uh, the national average is about 41 percent. And uh, our nursing pass rate has uh, been been right around 100%. And uh, and our students come from uh, across Montana, but also 44 states and 15 countries. Um, and uh, we're we're a traditional residential based campus, so we have um, close to a thousand students who call this home. They live here, and uh, they're here at least nine months a year. So it has a a significant impact from the, the Helena community, and one of the one of the other things that that's, I think is exciting is um, the students who come from here from other states and other countries. Five years after uh, graduation, 72% uh, of our graduates are working in Montana, across Montana. So we're a, we're a net importer of talent for Montana at a time that uh, my good friend Scott will tell you um, we desperately need more people working in Montana. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, and one of the other things that I like to mention is we're, we're a private school, but we're very, very generous with financial aid. And so a high academic achiever 
and uh, a high high need student uh, can can go to school here at Carroll, uh, typically for within about a hundred dollars of what it would cost to go to one of our two flagship uh, institutions in Montana, NSU or U of M. So that works out very well. Our students are engaged in service and. This past year, even with the pandemic, we logged uh, 25,000 hours of service here in the community, in the state, and uh, and across the country uh, this past year. And typically, when we're not in a world pandemic, our students are also engaged in service uh, across uh, other countries, uh, not so much during the pandemic. Um, we've had some wonderful opportunities to partner with tribal colleges over the past couple of years. And these partnerships have uh, truly strengthened our institutions and, and the sense of, of student learning. And I'll give you just a few examples. Um, uh, Carol emphasizes research uh, and particularly uh, undergraduate research. In fact, most of our students here have the opportunity to participate in undergraduate research experiences. And for the past 12 years, uh, our biology uh, professors and students have partnered with tribal faculty and students to conduct West Nile virus research um, through the collecting and analyzing of mosquitoes. Over 100 Native American students from Ana Nakoda, Little Bighorn College, Salish Kootenai College, Chief Dalnaik College, Montana State University, and Carroll College have participated in this collaborative research. Uh, effort that's, that's been featured nationwide. Last May, 16 students from Rocky Boy participated in a college immersion program here on our campus, and the two-day program was led by biology and political science faculty and supported by a Carroll alumni member who graduated from Rocky Boy High School and is now serving as the Dear of Liaison. And then prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, we hosted a week-long summer bridge program with students from Chief Dolnay uh, um, College. And uh, the students lived here on campus. They lived in our dorms. They ate in the, uh, uh, the food service and attended classrooms and participated in research in, in the laboratory environments to better experience what it's like to be on a residential college campus. To date, 20 Four students have com uh, completed that program, 24 uh, tribally enrolled members, and we're very proud of that. And many of our students have participated in activities and events on tribal lands. Our, our student uh, philanthropy club uh, held a fundraiser for uh, Blackfeet Food Bank. On our campus ministry sponsors student trips to uh, Browning. And several years ago, one of our senior level classes traveled to Ana Nakota College to learn from tribal elders and health officials. Um, our tribal colleges and Carroll have uh, had several faculty-to-faculty -faculty collaborations, including serving on advisory boards, panel discussions, joint research, and student clinicals. And Carroll College has benefited greatly uh, from our partnership with the Helena Indian Alliance's Leo Bocha Memorial Clinic. In fact, when the when the pandemic was was uh, really just beginning, um, uh, the members of, of that clinic stepped up and uh, uh, vaccinated a good number of our students and uh, spent several days up here, uh, in, and including many of our uh, employees were vaccinated. So we really appreciate the support of the Helena Indian Alliance. And then Carol just launched a Master of Social Work program. Um, and we're currently teaching our first cohort, and our faculty, um, uh, wonderful faculty, um, have been in contact with several tribal leaders and are developing residency options on the reservations. This spring, we're planning for residencies on the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And while I'm proud of the past collaboration, one of my priorities for Carroll is to expand our partnerships and collaborations with Montana's tribes. That's why having you here today is so valuable and so important. Um, and so I just uh, look, look forward to talking and hopefully breaking bread over uh, our um, lunch together uh, this afternoon and brainstorming on, on how we might be able to work even more closely together to uh, 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 build bridges, build partnerships, and build opportunities. 
um, because uh, we we so value uh, our relationship and 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 the opportunity to work. So I'll pause there for for any questions and thanks again for the opportunity. Do we have any questions? Any questions online? I do have a question. Um, how are, are you recruiting uh, Native students from across the state? Are you guys recruiting, like, going to the tribal colleges, or what's the recruitment effort look like? Yes, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we work uh, closely with the tribal colleges and obviously are, are uh, working to develop uh, um, uh, bridging partnerships for students who maybe have completed an associate's degree and want to continue on to complete their bachelor's degree. Um, or in the case of Sayers Kutney, they may have completed a uh, bachelor's degree and, and want to come on to, to uh, develop a master's degree. And um, But one of the things, and, and, and maybe this is an opportunity for lunch conversation, but I think we can do better. And, and I, think, I think we as, as an institution can, can hopefully uh, do a better job of articulating the, the opportunities that, that exist uh, to come to school here, as, as well as the, the, you know, the fact that, that it is affordable and, and we have tremendous scholarship opportunities. Much of it is, is made available through Carol itself to make it affordable. And, and I think to also shine the light and, and highlight uh, some of our, our own uh, American Indian graduates uh, or students who are here uh, to, uh, to really help them to be uh, better, better bridges and, and ambassadors. Yeah, I think that's a perception across uh, Indian country in Montana is that Carroll College is not affordable for folks, and so I, that would be an important, uh, I think, item for you guys to, to talk about the scholarships that are available. Um, and even uh, maybe even having some sort of partnership with U of M and, and MSU, because they both have large numbers of Native students, and how are they getting them? You know, it, it would be a, a good conversation, I think, to have. Absolutely, and uh, and we do uh, we have partnerships with with the, the two uh, flagship universities uh, through uh, three two partnerships and uh, three three partnership. For example, um, working with um, the uh, law college at uh, the University of Montana, students can go to school at Carroll College for three years, and then go to the University of Montana for three years and in six years graduate with both a bachelor's degree and a Jewish doctorate, um, which actually the relationship that they have, uh, the University of Montana with, has with Carroll College, a student can, can earn their Jewish doctorate actually a year sooner if they start at Carroll College than if they actually began at the University of Montana. So it, we have some great partnerships, and uh, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's emphasizing that um, there are incredible financial aid opportunities available, and uh, and one of the other things I think that's important you know, to note is that um, you know we have the, the highest four-year graduation rate in Montana and and four surrounding states, and uh, and the highest retention rate in, in the state. So our students come in and and they they exit in four years. So. It, it, there, there's tremendous savings for students to leave uh, with a degree after four years versus if they might be somewhere for six years. One last thing. Uh, I think if you guys are serious about that, you may want to consider, you know, what the other universities do. They have a, like a, a native outreach coordinator, you know, to, to help with that effort. Absolutely. That's a fantastic idea. Very good. So let's go around and do introductions. Um, we'll start with the folks at the table. Maria. Thank you, Chairwoman Sian. 
Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Maria Valandra, and I am the Bureau Chief for the Office of Indian Country Economic Development, uh, which is part of the Montana Department of Commerce. So welcome. We're so glad to have all of you that are here in the room and all of you that are on Zoom. We appreciate you being with us this morning, and um, we have a full agenda, so we're hoping that you can hear us fine and that uh, we will we will, all of you will be engaged in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and good morning. I am Richard Sangre. I'm Chief Staff for the Chippewa Creek Tribe and uh, also the Vice Chairman of the State Tribal Economic Development Commission and sat on this board for about 14 years now. Uh, I appreciate uh, your uh, inviting us to the college here. Um, I know uh, uh, Sapphire Carter, who graduated from here, was one of the ones that you were talking about. And hopefully we'll get more, uh, more students going to Carroll. Leanne Taylor just joined us. Leanne, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yes, good morning, everybody. Leanne Taylor, I'm the new division administrator for the Business MT division at the Department of Commerce, and I'm excited to um, be here for the, the meeting and see all the exciting things that you guys have. Thanks. Okay. My name is Shelley Fyant, and I serve as the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribal Representative on the Fed Commission for um, two terms. Um, today will be my last meeting, and we'll cover that during the afternoon session. So, oh. Hey, I'm Scott Osterman, Director of Commerce, um, and I, I just want to say thank you to everyone, especially everyone online. I, I realize it's a, it's a long drive no matter where you are in Montana, so um, Zoom has sort of helped us there in one regard, but it would be great to see all of you soon. Uh, in person. So thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here. Good morning. My name is Erin Butts. I'm a faculty in the newly established um, Master's of Social Work program here at Carroll College. Um, I don't take it lightly to be here, and I've been in many, if not all, of your communities across the state. Um, I deeply regard any opportunity uh, to work with our tribes. And uh, thank you, Stephanie, for the invitation to be here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Ironshooter. I'm a Ani and Chungu, and I'm actually by way of Fort Belknap. My dad is from Rosebud, South Dakota. So that's where Iron Shooter comes from. People say, where's Iron Shooter come from? Um, I'm actually the new American Indian Health Director for the Department of Public Health and Human Services. Maria has graciously allowed me to come today to kind of crash your party just to listen and, and be considerate and think about um, how, of course, health care, health care, excuse me, um, addressing health disparities fits into economic development. And it does, right? And I mean, the college, you know, higher education, all of that, it, it, it all ties in. And I'm just really here to listen and learn from you all. And um, I will be reaching out if I haven't already. Um, I, I talked with Richard on last week. So I'll be reaching out to all of you individually just to kind of get your input on the direction that my position can take our people. And I, I really uh, pray and hope that I do the best for our people. And that, that's why I'm here. Billy? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Billy Ledoux. I am the program manager for the State Tribal Economic Development Commission and for the Office of Indian Country Economic Development at the Montana Department of Commerce. And I will call names as I see them online. So, Gerald, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm Gerald Gray. I'm the chairman of the Little Shell Tribe. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, Rainey Walsh. Good morning, everybody. 
I I work for the um, Fort Belknap Economic Credit Development, and I'm just here to learn. This is my first meeting, so I hope I gained a lot of knowledge today, and nice to meet everybody online. <laughs> Uh, Delina. Hi, good morning. Um, Delina Cuts the Rope, Chief Administrative Officer for the Fort Belknap Indian Community. Um, I also serve on the STED Commission. I've served before um, as alternate. Um, I'm looking forward to participating in the STED Commission, um, making a difference. I agree with the um, consult, uh, collective impact um, efforts uh, to, to try to gather um, you know, the various tribes priorities. I mean, we fight, you know, with the BIA prioritization, we fight with, you know, um, uh, TBIC and all that kind of thing. And a lot of times our priorities kind of get watered down as they go across the nation. So I do believe that every tribe is different, but at the same time, we're the same. So it's very complicated. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, I'm Fort Belknap, um, you know, we're always constantly vigilanting, vigilantly trying to support economic development to bring back, you know, basic opportunity, basic services to the individuals on our reservation, just to try to, you know, to make an impact on our tribal economy, to try to try to be continue to be resilient. And it's and it is difficult um, with, you know, lack of access to capital and whatnot, but we're always trying to find ways to continue to improve our tribal operations. Um, our planning for them short and long term, and then of course our fiscal management. Um, also continuing to identify funding for economic development on the reservation um, to include educational opportunities. Um, and then also paying a lot of attention to our infrastructure improvements. Um, we have a lot of projects that intertwine with uh, heavy reliance on good infrastructure. Um, uh, increasing housing. Um, we have um, some projects underway right now um, for housing development. Um, we've been able to reap in a lot of HUD grant opportunities um, in partnership with our housing authority. So, you know, that's, you know, promising for us there. Um, just continuing to create opportunities to increase, Im improve our resource management, our land use and recreation plans. Um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the projects that we're tracking right now are our Eagle Valley Housing Development Project. That's the one where we're, we're, <clears throat> we're combining multiple funding uh, sources uh, to a combined housing development project. We haven't had much housing development on Fort Belknap in many, many years. So we're really excited about this project to create 40 homes. Um, we're also, um, invested some capital investment and in remodeling into our local quick stop convenience store. And we're also um, in the process this spring um, uh, for continuing on with the hammer and nail renovation of our law enforcement building um, that will give us um, a, a drug processing center, which we so much need for um, public safety. Um, we're also, we've have built a, a new child care center and we are looking at doing an addition on the Southern end of the reservation um, to our Head Start, Early Head Start Center to create um, more childcare resources for those folks that need it. Um, and then we have, um, we will also uh, be working on, um, these are not searching things, these are actually implementation things on our spring development, on our tribal range units. That's really important, especially with the drought that Montana has been facing, as well as a lot of the Western states. The drought has almost been neck and neck with the pandemic as far as emergencies goes. Um, we have um, about 8,000 um, livestock animals um, just, you know, uh, uh, that our producers are trying to <clears throat> make a living off of. And we've had a lot of folks have to sell out because they just don't have the water capacity to support their herds. So for Fort Belknap, um, having a drought management plan, which we do needs to be um, updated. And we're kind of whipping it both sides right now with two months before turnout. So, um, those are kind of some, just some topics um, uh, that are kind of important to Fort Belknap right now, but I'm sure I've missed several others and I just appreciate the opportunity um, here too, to listen, to catch up, um, to try to see what STED in, is, is um, moving forward on, on a collective impact model. 
um, so that you know we can make sure that our voice is heard. Like you said, in the Montana legislature, legislature's legislative session coming up, and and um, whatever we can do to work together, um, I'm on board with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Misty Cole. I am the governor's director of Indian Affairs uh, for the state of Montana. I am also a member of Fort Belknap Indian Community. Um, thank you so much for um, attending today. And I'm looking forward to the good work we're going to get done. And um, uh, President, I, I really wanted to let you know that before I was appointed to this position, I actually was the Native American Outreach Coordinator and Director for Rocky Mountain College. So if there, if if you'd like any assistance with um, helping to reach out to Native students, please get in touch with me and I'm happy to um, shoot some ideas around with you. Thank you, Misty. Uh, Sean. Well, good morning. Um, just like to welcome everybody to the State Tribal Economic Development Commission. Um, I work for a Little Bighorn College representing uh, the Crow Tribe and representing the Economic Development Department and uh, the Ag Department here at Little Bighorn College. I am um, moving forward on an Ag curriculum and Ag degree over here at uh, Little Bighorn College. In addition to that, I teach classes. So with that, um, I've been many years with the State Tribal Economic Development Commission, and I'd like to state to the president of Carroll College, uh, I sure appreciate his presentation today and all the great things that he's uh, working on to uh, essentially assist and support Native American students attaining their higher education. And with that, uh, I see where uh, higher uh, education throughout the Indian country and other places, I see where there's a big emphasis on trying to support uh, Native students, retaining the Native students. And I think that uh, that's a big trend. I think that we need to keep on going with that trend and make sure that we make inroads and things like that. I see where uh, there, uh, uh, the student Indian affairs coordinators that are appointed at each and every uh, college. Uh, now they're moving into uh, a new realm where they're developing uh, essentially Native American Indian dorms. I see where that uh, they have uh, different uh, uh, meetings, uh, get togethers, dinners, uh, everything from uh, sewing ribbon skirts to beadwork to just uh, going to movies. In addition to that study, uh, a certain type of study hall and things like that are set up for them. And I think that there's great support in that. And I see that there's also support for the Indian student athlete where they can essentially work with the coaches and assist and support and communicate and make sure that uh, they uh, maintain their student athletic careers. So with that, I know that uh, we'll be making more um, headway in those areas. And I think that uh, it's a great trend throughout uh, the educational institutions across America. So with that, uh, I sure appreciate uh, being on the state commission. That's it. Thank you, Sean. Um, next on my screen is Matt. Yeah, I'm Matt Harrington uh, with Native American Community Development Corporation in Browning. Um, I, uh, I'm the Native American Business Advisor for, um, through, for the Indian Equity Fund uh, grant um, application process here at Blackfeet. And um, yeah, I think I'm, I'll talk here in a minute um, of, about some other programs we've done with the state, but um, yeah, that's my intro. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, Velma. Kisa Quitnam. Good morning, everyone. My name is Delta Shelby. I'm the director of the Economic Development Office with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. It's so nice to meet you all, and it's good to see you all virtually. Thank you for everything you're doing with all of you STEDS members and Maria and her staff, and of course, Scott and the Department of Commerce. Thank you. Uh, Adam. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Adam Schaefer, uh, Deputy Director at the Montana Department of Commerce and uh, work uh, for Director Osterman and, and work closely with uh, Leanne Taylor and Maria and Billy and Luke and looking forward to the meeting and to helping out wherever I can. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Cheryl. Luke. Thank you, Billy. Good morning. I'm Luke Robinson. I am the Native Entrepreneur Development Specialist for the Office of Indian Country Programs as well. I work in the Indian Country Financial Assistance, running the Indian Equity Fund Small Business Grant, and overseeing the Native American Business Advisors, uh, such as Matt here in the room, which we'll discuss a little bit later. However, I did um, work in economic development the last decade on and off. Matt is a seasoned uh, advisor in his organization as well. So we just look forward to everything today, and thank you. Thanks, Luke. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Madam Chair Fiance. Okay, very good. My only job is to keep us on time, and um, thank you guys <laughs> for that. <laughs> you made it easy for me. Okay, so um, now we'll have a rundown of our Office of Indian Country Economic Development Programs, and we'll start off with the Indian Equity Fund for fiscal year 2022. Luke? And before Luke gets started, for those of you that are new uh, to STED and new to what, we're, what we do at the Office of Indian Country Economic Development, our presentation this morning is to go over some of the programs we wanted, uh, we wanted to show you, uh, first of all, with the Indian Equity Fund um, fiscal year 22, the grants that we've made, and that's what Luke's going to go over. And then we put together um, and asked Matt Harrington to be with us. Matt's going to talk about um, how our NABA, which stands for Native American Business Assistance, our NABAs, which we have one that serves every reservation. So Matt serves uh, Blackfeet, the Blackfeet Nation. And he's going to talk to us about how the NABAs work with the Indian Equity Fund and the Native American Collateral Support, which is another one of our programs. And he's going to talk about some success stories with those three programs that we have. And then I will be talking about tribal tourism. Um, we have a uh, open position right now with our tribal tourism officer. So I will, um, uh, in absence of that person, I will be giving a kind of an update on tribal tourism. So just just to kind of uh, help you understand why this is on the agenda and how these programs work together. So with that, I'll hand it over to Luke. Okay, thank you, Maria. And Luke, you may need, you may need to, in the room, it's kind of in and out, choppy. So whatever you can do to speak closer into your mic would maybe be helpful. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a headset today. <clears throat> that would have helped. However, is there a PowerPoint that you're going to um, be using for today? Otherwise, I can try to share my screen and find the one that I had put together. Maria? Uh, yeah, Billy's controlling the PowerPoint on our end, so we, we're we ready to go. We just are having a hard time hearing you for whatever reason. So maybe you can call in on the phone number. Yeah, I'll definitely that do that. Help. No, that'll work. And then you have to mute your computer, remember. While Luke is calling in, um, does anybody have any questions or comments at this point in the agenda?
Gerald, are you with us yet? I'm sorry, yeah. Sorry. I thought about that. Yeah. Okay, it sounds like it's working. It like it's working. Uh, I can hear myself. Okay, I don't see what's on the screen, so I'll just start with the Indian Equity Fund Small Business Grant for the fiscal year 22. Yeah, it's still, I can hear it echoing as well. Yep. Yeah. On your team under uh, unmute, what you do is you click on that button and then you go to audio and then these volume, just take that all the way down. And then you just, oh, then just talk yeah, right into your phone. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay, I think it's okay think, now. Okay, yeah, I think that's going to work. Sorry about that again. Um, on the first slide, I see that we have just an overview of this, this year's fiscal year, how it went uh, with 122 applications, uh, another um, precedented number in terms of applications received last year and this year were the highest. Uh, we funded 24 or three per tribe. That's up to $14,000. So start with the black feet. Again, sorry, I don't know what, what I'm looking at there or what you're seeing there, but the black feet are Casey's RV in East Glacier, Casey McDonald. And I kind of show you these and read through them as well. It's an existing tourism business over in East Glacier, one of the few native-owned locations over on that side. But they received 14,000 to improve the bathrooms and add electrical wiring to the RV uh, campground spots. Glacier Elkhorn cabins, way up in Bab, Audrey Valley, Arvale Valley, um, existing tourism, mother-son uh, partnership few employees and they want to purchase lumber to do kind of the work themselves and upgrade the cabins, um, put some awnings on, et cetera, for the winter so they can open up um, more than just seasonal, but try to go year round. <clears throat> Sparkles Beauty Salon is a new startup in Browning, Brian and Grace King. Um, those folks have great character. I think when we work for the university system as well, uh, Brian did, excuse me, and Grace has uh, the experience with uh, cosmetology, et cetera. So full-time shop with a few chairs to rent to open to the community as well, I believe. And you see the one nail tech, one massage therapist, 12,000 just to upgrade everything in, inside that, you know, renovate everything with the plumbing, electrical, drywall, flooring, et cetera. So that's it for Black Feet. Move on to the Chippewa. <clears throat> and I see Central Machine and Ag Repair in Big Sandy is Amber Terry. Um, one of the few, you know, um, a different location there, but it's an existing machining and welding shop. They received 13,000 to get this special shear for cutting and a large cabinet and rest remaining on a skid steer just to improve their cash flows and help their business out like that. Double E Box Elder is a new, or it's an existing food truck, but she wants to purchase a new uh, mobile food trailer and has a few employees, um, a lot more seasonal and wanting to upgrade everything. So she was doing a good job, had good uh, cash flow, rapport, everything. So we decided to fund her. Log Creations, Box Elder, Ira Moreno, 
He is an existing lumber business. He's a sole proprietor. And great, I can see it now. Um, thank you, Billy. 14000 to purchase a new sawmill, a specialized sawmill with a swing blade. So he found an outfit in Seattle, I believe, and we're working with the vendor to get that uh, to him. And that'll definitely increase. We had another sawmill type business last year, and they're just a lot more busier, so a lot more busy. So that's kind of what the intention of this is. And Salish and Kootenai. There's a new or an existing body shop. And these are kind of fairly new, one to two years old at times is why they're existing. But um, most of them are pretty early in the, you know, early startup phases. Um, but 12,000 to purchase equipment, uh, welder, expand services and metal fabrication and extend that a little ways. Arrow Rock in Polson, Ethan Freelander, a young sole proprietor, construction business, kind of just doing a little bit of everything but also purchasing a dump trailer to increase capabilities. That's going to be a good one. He's kind of a go-getter. So it has been, been fun to work with and just getting to know everybody right now. So I'll have more to the story at the end um, of the, of the uh, grant cycle, basically. Heir to the Throne is another fun name. The young lady, Leanne Youngkin, is uh, doing a startup barbershop salon in Polson. I guess maybe downtown Polson with uh, three booths or stations to rent. And she did the 14,000 to purchase equipment and supplies and just kind of do some remodeling for fixtures, leasehold improvements, et cetera. And it's going to be a pretty good um, salon. Okay, thanks for that. I'll go to Crow next. Through colors, um, paint is in Haver. However, Patricia Huntley is an existing business construction business, paint and construction. And she received 12,000 to purchase a new work truck, which is needed. And rest is a few of the rest is gonna to go to equipment upgrades. And she's putting that list together and expand and do more work around the area. New stuff was a unique one. It's over in Crow, Jalen Two Liggins and his spouse, an existing business, fairly new though, operating a mobile food truck and um, average uh, service to the community there. They're also picking and sourcing local herbs and that kind of thing, just keeping it a little bit more cultural and healthy that way. But they're going to get a new trailer to um, utilize their, for their mobile food truck. They're excited about that. And Real Bird tra Trail Rides down in Gary Owen, um, kind of in Real Bird Loop. Curtis Real Bird, an existing sole proprietor operating a trail ride business for years has a good clientele list has a good reputation there good character 13,000 to purchase a lot of equipment for the horses etc for the facilities that kind of thing supplies to improve uh, the overall trail ride business thank you Billy Fort Belknap Crasco and Crasco construction Dodson Dave Crasco it's an existing um, business there. 13,000 to purchase an end dump trailer. Increased efficiencies that was specific to the end, end dump part of it, not the side dump or anything. This is kind of a um, bigger deal to move bigger things and that kind of work. So happy about that. Marlin's Heating, Cooling and Appliance in Harlem. Marlin Lawrence, independent contractor, HVAC, all those type of things. And Purchasing equipment with a hydraulic lift gate and router router for um, just basic healthy growth in his business. Resolution Harlem is Air Lemire. She is a unique photographer, has a lot of experience in training, and just wants to kind of grow and do more, I'll do a lot more. So she purchased a super nice new, <laughs> excuse me, camera. Actually, we're having trouble with um, maybe some existing COVID related stuff with uh, the camera. That she was looking at so we're looking to purchase a camera still working with her on that however that'll just increase her business and she's looking to do more training etc port pack 653 custom design Wayne hamilton is an existing um, print shop basically with a few employees and he's looking to purchase a new printer to, that'll increase production um, just upgrade everything Bean windshield is a young 
young guy, young entrepreneur that's an existing windshield repair business that he's uh, working with his, it's kind of a family business, but he's doing his own thing with a specific windshield repair. He's going to, we've seen this a lot recently too with a later model vehicle, it just needs more, uh, a bigger lift, bigger location, bigger um, access to work on these vehicles. 12,000 for that. RX car wash in Wolf Point, Corey Room. That's an, exist, or that's an existing car wash that he purchased in 2021, but it's a well needed service in the community. So he's going to upgrade a lot of the equipment to you know the late the newest uh, technology and upgrade the new payment system as well. A little shelf, 406 custom auto and Sam over in Haver, Haver William Madrill. Existing car and audio retail business, they purchased a ton of inventory and supplies to prepare for this next season. So they're really stocked up and ready to go. Indian Paintbrush and Cut Bank, Sky Gillum is actually, excuse me, that's going to, yeah, she is in Cut Bank. However, she does, she did purchase some land in East Glacier, looking to start a new retail gift shop type of thing for, um, you know, tourist season. And she's Really scaling that up um, big time, so she's getting ready for that. Playing Soul and Harden, um, some of you might know Carrie McKillop Cleary, uh, existing retail and art business, just kind of renowned. And she's, oh yeah, the specific numbers there, sorry, the 13,333.33 to purchase a finished trailer for her to use as a storefront because she's kind of been selling at shows and out of the house, that kind of thing. But this will just be a secure way of doing that. and. The little shell um, specifically split up the money, you know, equally. So that was really fair and a interesting, a good way to do it like that. Next, we got Northern Cheyenne Bark Park, Bark Park here in Billings, where I'm located at in Rustiana Veros. Young entrepreneur has experience uh, working with the dog business and liked it so much that he recently opened up his own. Um, dog park uh, and boarding business. So he purchased 14,000, or he, excuse me, received 14,000 to purchase artificial turf for the outdoor pet area. So it's all sanitary, safe, and that kind of thing. Hot Rock Healing and Spa Services and Reindeer is Donita Sue. She's an existing uh, non traditional wellness um, service and business with massage therapy, all that kind of thing. And we received 14000 to purchase a small cabin for her to continue running her business and um, have a better venue for people. Warrior Trail is an existing gift shop with a lame deer with Sierra Atkinson and her mother. We got 12000 to purchase this big storage unit, storage bin, so they can keep a lot more of their growing, um, increasing inventory safe. And at the end, we'll have success stories. Oh, you're fine. And yeah, that's it. That's all I have for the Indian Equity Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. That's very exciting to see all these new entrepreneurs popping up and the existing ones expanding their businesses. So thank you for that good news. So we'll move right into uh, the Native Business Success Story with Matt. All right, um, so, uh, yep, so uh, if you wanna go to the next slide there. All right, so yeah, um, my, like I said before, my name is Matt Harrington. I work for um, Native American Community Development Corporation and we are a certified native CDFI. Um, we were started by Eloise Cabell in 2011, uh, shortly before she, she passed away. Um, and we do offer, we offer full suite of loan options and technical assistance, so we, everything from home loans, personal loans, business loans, ag loans. Um, and then we offer technical assistance and, and education and outreach that go with each of those uh, financial projects. Um, and we're, we are based uh, here at Blackfeet, but we, we serve all seven reservations um, and we've had loans in uh, three other states besides Montana. Um, so we are, um, yeah, definitely statewide. Um, 
and I, I've been here six years, and I know I know we were part of the NAVA program before that. So um, I, we've we've been part of the Native American Business Advisors Program for for quite a while. So if you want to go ahead and the next slide, All right? So um, uh, yeah, the main reason I wanted to talk was to share about the Native American Collateral Support Program and how we were able to use that. Um, uh, so the deal, um, the the way we were able to use it, there's a uh, a little shell tribal member who wanted to open a meat processing facility. Um, and he, he had oh, quite a bit of industry experience. He'd actually run his own meat processing facility over in Mott, North Dakota. Um, and and it, uh, a fire kind of ended things there. Um, but he definitely had experience. He was a hard worker, knew what he was doing. Um, and then he was, he was actually located um, in Powder River County, um, which it, if you don't know, Broadus is like the biggest town in that area. Um, so it's far, uh, Southeast Montana, um, but it's a huge cow country. There's, you know, a ton of cow, a ton of cattle in that area. And he saw this opportunity. Uh, there's a, there's a high, higher demand, especially after the pandemic or during the pandemic um, for people to get uh, meat processed more locally. And so he kind of took advantage of that. Um, he was able to get um, some of the state meat processing grant money uh, that went out that first year in 2020. and uh, got to start on his on his uh, processing facility, but he really, his goal was to be state and federal inspected, and still is. Um, and so he needed quite a bit more to, to finish the deal. And so that's where the, um, we were able to offer him a loan. And then, and uh, with that, the um, we, we used the Native American Collateral Support Program. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the reason we needed it, um, there was a few, it, uh, we knew once once the facility was up and running, there would be enough collateral for for us to be secure on the loan. But um, the it was actually built on someone else's land, which made uh, it a little bit less secure. Um, we we were able to secure a mortgage on the land eventually, but it it, it was a little complicated. Um, and then the even even with that mortgage, we there was a, such a huge appraisal bottleneck, and especially in that area, there was basically one appraiser that was willing to do it and he was several months out and um and there was time was taking we as part of the loan process i'd asked justin to um i'm oh, sorry i think i forgot to mention his name his name is justin ogier uh anyways i'd asked justin to kind of uh talk to producers and get them to commit to to um using him and so he had all these all, all this work lined up basically um, so every day that he wasn't open, he was losing money essentially. And um, so we didn't want to wait for the appraiser. Um, so we we decided to use the Native American Collateral Support Program to kind of fill in the hole on the collateral. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> and then it, it was a, a super complicated deal in a number of aspects. So there was, um, we, we had, after initially applying for the support program, we had to, um, there's a change to the loans so we had to resubmit um but it only actually took about a month um once we had resubmitted to be approved um so that that part was pretty pretty seamless um we wanted to have the uh and for those of you who don't know i should maybe explain that the native american collateral support program basically um the state uh loans the lending institution uh collateral in the form of uh cds and then and that's as collateral when there's insufficient collateral for the loan. And then as that um, that loan is paid back, the the CDs are returned to the state. So that's kind of just the short version of how it works. Um, so normally the pre previous uh, 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 institutions that had used it had, had done all their uh, uh, CDs through a specific bank. And we wanted it to do it in a bank that we had money in. So um, it took a little bit uh, just to, to coordinate that with um, our, our bank and then the State Department of Commerce. And um, so we, so, so yeah, that took a little bit, but there's other complicating factors with the loan. So ultimately the the CDs were, were finalized just as the loan closed um, right at the end of the year. So that's how it worked. Um, yeah, and then I also wanted to highlight um, the Indian Equity Fund, which I've been a part of. Um, so I, I could, there's numerous success stories I could point to several, um, but I wanted to hi highlight Mario McCullough. 
um, owner of Big Chief Chinese. Uh, so he, uh, I think he's been about three years ago that he he applied for the for the grant, and he um, Blackfeet tribal member, but he grew up in Spokane and was trained as a as a chef. Went to school for it, um, worked under separate, several different restaurants and uh, catering services. So he's definitely very talented um, in that area, and he wanted to move back. Um, and uh, his wife is from here as well, so they wanted to move back. And um, so he he applied for the grant. He was he's, he was contacting me like several months in advance before the grant came out. And so he had a, he had a great business plan by the time it happened. And um, he got, he received the grant and then kind of the ideal situation from my perspective is if, if they can get a grant and if they need a loan to kind of finish the project, they can get a loan from us. And that's, that's what happened with Mario. Um, and so, yeah, so he had, he got a loan uh, and a grant to finish uh, his, his restaurant building and opened up um, you can see there in the picture, uh, Care TV came up and did a special with him um, on uh, kind of his process in cooking. So, and yeah, if you want to go to the next slide there. So if you can see there on that slide, the um, he he kind of went after people to to review him on Google and got really good reviews. He's about a block off Highway Two, so a lot of people going to Glacier. Um, have have stopped in um, and have really liked his food. So his food quality is really good, um, and uh, yeah, feedback from the community and from the tourists have been has been really good. Um, like everybody else, especially restaurant owners, he had to navigate the pandemic and um, figure out how that how, what that meant. Um, there were several months where it was takeout only, um, which he ended up doing pretty well with, but. Um, he, he definitely wants wants people to be able to sit down in his restaurant and enjoy the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, he navigated the pandemic and um, through some of those some of the grants that were offered through the pandemic and through his business, he was able to pay off his loan with us way early. Um, and now he's kind of on to his next project. He's um, going to open an Italian restaurant in Cut Bank. Um, we were able to get him a loan to do that um, and hopefully keep the Chinese restaurant open at the same time. Um, so that's yeah, it's a pretty pretty cool use of the program. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a question: the restaurant that he's opening in Cup Bank is that going to be a Chinese restaurant too? No, it's going to be an Italian restaurant. Um, yeah, he's he's cooked several different cuisines, but I think he he grew up cooking Italian, um, so it's kind of his passion. And yeah, so it'll be an Italian. Um, yeah, could we go to the next slide? Sorry, I can't see the, it just went off. I, I could see it before. Which slide are we on? Hold on one second. John, do you have your hand raised? Yeah, I have a quick uh, question for Matt there. Uh, one quick note, uh, are they, some of these uh, business people, are they um, incorporated? Are they sole proprietorship? Are they LLC? The reason I'm stating this, uh, in, uh, in years past, I run into problems with um, tribal business people who have had uh, restaurants and um, they've been within the boundaries of the reservation. But IRS would uh, would want a big. Uh, uh, they would have a big tax debt with the IRS because they didn't have an LLC and things like that, and they had to go out of business. So that's why we developed the LLC for protection of their business. So with that, I was wondering: um, are they are they incorporated within the authority of the their, the tribal government up there, or how are we moving in that direction? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, I would say mo we, uh, most uh, most operating businesses on, on Blackfeet are registered with the tribe um, at the very least. And then like in, the, in this particular case, Mario, is, he also has an LLC that's reg registered with the state. Um, and I, most of them that do, 
I would say most of most of our businesses that it's 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 their main livelihood, the owner's livelihood, um, are are registered with the state as an LLC. But yeah, it's it definitely definitely something that business owners need to look into. And Sean, um, uh, Luke does a, I think it's every two or three months, a networking call with the Indian Equity Fund recipients or anybody else that's interested. And there's one that's coming up here, I believe next week, uh, he's asked the Secretary of State's office to come and do a presentation about registering with the state. So if you're interested in attending that, we can sure get you the the Zoom information. Sure, I know that uh, there's a lot of gray area between uh, businesses that are registered on an Indian reservation, whether it's LLC or sole proprietorship. And uh, I think that at some point in time, we need a roadmap for uh, Indian businesses. That way we eliminate any kind of gray area. And so that uh, there'd be more chances of success for this uh, individual business. And um, it's something that we need to hammer out and main, maintain on a constant basis. Yeah. Go on mute. That's a project that uh, Luke is working on right now with SBA uh, to kind of work through that roadmap. Um, SBA has a booklet out there called How to Start a Business in Montana, and we want to take the, the, the template in, and make something that is how to start a native business in Montana. Um, and so that will have the roadmap that you're talking about with you know, how do you register your business with the state? How do you register it with your tribe, the different types of businesses, et cetera? So thank you for keying that up. Yeah, thanks. That's good, good to bring up. All right, so yeah, just a summary of the Indian Equity Friend program um, uh, that kind of I've seen over the last uh, couple of years, I guess. Um, Huge application upswing from um, there. Just nationally, there's been a, an upswing in small businesses um, since COVID, and that's definitely been reflected in Indian Equity Fund applications. Um, in 2020, we had like 28 applications at Blackfeet, which a normal year is like 13 to 16, um, and we had you know higher than normal this last year as well. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I really think it's it's valuable because the process starts businesses, even if they go unfunded. So whether that means they they got their plan together and they got a loan or they realized what they needed to do and were able to fund it um, another way, even if they don't get the, the Indian Equity Fund grant, a lot of businesses start because of the program. Um, so it kind of has a, a shadow effect. Um, and then I it's just, it's really cool to, to me to be able to walk out our, our doors and then walk up kind of Main Street Browning and, and look at the different businesses. And there's several, four, four or five that you can see just walking up the um, Main Street here um, that have been funded by the Indian Equity Fund grant. Um, and you could you could drive up through BAB as well. And there's, you know, you could say, oh, that business got it that year and that business the other year. Um, so it's definitely had a big impact on the community. Um, and I just think in terms of bang for your buck, it's it's one of the best things for small businesses um, on at Blackfeet for sure, um, and I, probably across the state. Um, just in terms of the, it's it's fourteen thousand. It is not it's not a lot of money, and people, um, it, it's unfortunate. It, it it doesn't not everybody can get it, but um, a lot of businesses start because of it uh, as d directly funded, and then. Um, it, it incentivizes a lot of businesses to get, get started in the planning process. And even if they don't get funded the first year, maybe they do the next year, or maybe, it, maybe they're able to fund it another way. So in terms of uh, economic development, it's, it's a really good program. Um, and, and yeah, really good bang for the buck. Um, Luke gave me the, um, the recipients list for the last six years. And I kind of looked through them and jotted down who I thought was still in business and, 
who wasn't. And I'm, I'm pretty sure about 80% of the businesses that, that have been funded here at Blackfeet over the last six years are still in business. And more, I think more than half of them were either startups or had started up like a year or two before they got the grant. So that's, that's a really good success rate for, for small businesses. Um, and it, yeah, because of that, I think it's a really good program. So uh, next slide. <laughs> We go to the next slide. Oh yeah. It's really, so, any it's really good or? to hear that your inequity fund is it's helping all these startups and you know it's a tremendous resource for our Yeah, definitely. So we'll move on to tribal tourism. Maria. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Matt. That was a great presentation, and, and uh, I think you just solidified a survey that we did back in December of 20 about how many of our Indian Equity Fund recipients are still in business, and we had found back then that there was over 90 plus percent. So what you're saying on the Blackfeet Reservation is, is consistent with what we found appreciate that and hopefully you can stay with us um, as long as you can that would that would be great um, so tribal tourism uh, go ahead and go to the next slide uh, so we have a tribal tourism officer in, in this role and um, Dan Iverson was the our tribal tourism officer he left commerce in January and so we actually have the job posted right now up on the M website it closes February 21st and uh, we do have um, some applicants that have applied uh, both native and non-native at this point I'm really looking for somebody that has communications marketing experience and um, plus somebody that knows Indian country um, it's really hard to find people that actually have tourism backgrounds um, so we're hoping for the best, and we're going to be interviewing um, here uh, at the end of February, beginning of March, and hopefully we can have somebody on board, um, you know, in the next probably three or four weeks. So that would be the goal there. So if you know anybody that you think would be great in the position, uh, they have until Monday <laughs> uh, at midnight to apply. So. So um, at this point, uh, when Dan uh, was here, Dan and I traveled uh, and talked to Blackfeet, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, and CSKP about their tourism plans and what are some of their opportunities, what are some things that they're focusing on, um, and we still need to visit with Chippewa Cree, Fort Belknap, Fort Peck, and Little Shell. And so based on the visits with the first four tribes, Dan put together a SWOT analysis, and um, uh, we have some really good information uh, based on the four visits. If you want to go ahead and move forward on the slide, please. So this is probably hard for you to read, um, but and I won't read all of this, but based on the visits with the four tribes, um, you know, there are some some strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that have been identified. And what what we want to do is, of course, we'll add to this when we get to visit with the, the next four tribes. Um, but strengths, you know, I, I think some of this, uh, most of this is not um, a surprise. But, for example, you know, a lot of our Indian country in Montana, we have cultural and historical assets already. Um, that are known, you know, to be of interest to visitors from outside of the state. Um, a lot of our our reservation communities have existing traffic due to proximity to major attractions, you know, like Glacier Park, Yellowstone Park, um, the battlefield, um, the Buffalo Ranges, etc. Um, there are uh, you know, well-established events, the powwows, the rodeos, the, um, uh, the, just some other things that victory days, 
um, the reenactment, you know. So those are all strengths when it comes to tourism in Indian country. Some weaknesses that we found is that a lot of the tribes do not have a designated tourism person. And so when you're trying to work, you know, with to find out what is what things do they want to work on, what things are they, you know, what's their goals, um, what's their priorities, it's kind of difficult for us as a state anyways. Um, and other people that, like I just took a phone call yesterday from an organization that's working on the Bozeman Trail. And, um, you know, they have identified tribal folks that they've been working with. Um, but most of the time, uh, the folks that are working in tourism, that's not their main job. Like, for example, Cheryl, I'm not sure if she's on, on now, but Cheryl's the, the tribal planner for the Blackfeet tribe. Um, but she also, you know, is responsible for some of the parks and, um, and then manpower in, in Browning. They're responsible for the campgrounds. And, you know, so, um, so that, uh, can be a weakness. Um, also a weakness is absence of grant writers. Um, so, you know, if they want to apply for this, like, for example, the ARPA tourism dollars, uh, many of our tribes just don't have the grant writers to do that. And so they contract with people like RJS Swan and others. But right now, some of those grant writers are swamped because of all of the ARPA funds that are out. And so they only have so much capacity to help uh, tribes write grants. Um, limited resources to allocate to tourism, um, especially budget and staff. You know, again, um, the, the tribes do have limit budgets, and um, that's maybe part of the reason why they don't have people de dedicated in the tourism position. Um, as far as opportunities, you know, lots of opportunities we found uh, with four tribes that we've talked to so far. Um, a lot of opportunity to construct new and rehab re rehabilitate existing visitor facilities. Um, things like uh, powwow grounds, the bison range, ranges, um, um, signage, uh, destination development, uh, you know, getting, putting things online so that uh, visitors that are coming from out of state can find things online and find it, you know, when they actually go to Indian country. So there's just a lot of opportunity there. Um, some threats, of course, we're still dealing with the pandemic. And so, like, for example, right now, a lot of the tribes um, not really even sure if they're going to have their powwows. Um, you know, Blackfeet, they haven't announced that. Um, CSKT, they haven't announced it. Um, Crow, I think, is going to have Crow Fair. But um, it's still, we're still, you know, dealing with the pandemic. So that's a threat as far as bringing tourists to Indian country. Um, unpredictable and or misalignment of funding opportunities with special federal grants. Um, what we found talking to the tribes is that there is, there could, there is funding right now, for example, with ARPA, but some of the funding isn't available for what the tribes need. And so that's a, what we're calling a misalignment. Um, and so the, these are just some of the things that we found that I wanted to share with you. And we have, we have more to do here. Um, uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. So one of the things that we're doing at Commerce is we just put out a tribal tourism grant um, through our Department of Office of Indian Country Economic Development. We have not done that before, and we haven't had a grant through ICE, what we call OICE. Um, we do have a tourism department through Commerce, and they do put out a grant, but it's not just for tribes, it's for the entire state for tourism efforts. So this is the first one that's actually just for tribes. Um, it opened January 31st. It closes like in four weeks on March 18th. But they can, you know, based on our conversations with the tribes, they can use the money for destination development. If, you know, if they have areas that they want people to direct them to, um, then they can use this grant for that. 
they can use it to for some of their interest, infrastructure needs. Maybe they need to, um, you know, uh, their campgrounds need to fix toilets, those kinds of things. They can use this money for that. They can use it for signaging, signage, excuse me, to promote um, or market, you know, their their tourism spots. And the maximum is 50000 It's not a lot of money. Um, and there is a match to it. If they're asking, you know, for $6,000, they need to have $3,000 uh, of their own money um, into the project. And so um, uh, I just want, you know, for those of you that are on the phone, uh, this is just hopefully the beginning. And we're hoping that, you know, this is a positive that you guys can use the money for your tribal tourism efforts. And we're hoping um, through some of the commerce dollars that we can do a set aside, uh, cross our fingers for tribal tourism. Just wanted to make sure everyone is aware that there's the 2022 Governor's Conference on Tourism and Recreation that's going to be in Billings on April 17th through the 19th. And actually, the 17th is a Sunday and it's Easter, uh, but the Monday, the 18th, is when the conference starts. And we've been approached by the Crow Tribe. They want to do a blessing in the morning, so that's awesome. Um, and we're going to have, we've invited the president of IANTA, which is a national tourism group. Um, her name is Sherry Rupert. We've invited her to be the keynote at the conference. And then we're going to have a tribal tourism breakout session um, at the conference. And there's a group that's being formed across Montana, and they're calling themselves the Montana Indigenous Tourism Alliance Group. And they're going to have uh, their own kind of session at the end of the conference on Tuesday afternoon. So we're providing space for them there. Um, their chairperson of the alliance is uh, Gail Skunkcap. Uh, Gail works for Manpower at Blackfeet. And um, he's responsible for all of the Blackfeet Tribe uh, campgrounds. So that's our team right now. We have, again, we have an open position with Tribal Tourism, uh, but I'd like to open it up if anybody has any questions. This is Stephanie. Excuse me, Stephanie Iron Shooter. Sorry. How many grants are given out? What's the timeline on the? I mean, is it, is it like for a year? Does it? I mean, how long do you have to spend the money? I guess. And how many are you giving out? Okay. Uh, so you mean overall in our OI program? Okay. With the fifty thousand dollar um, ceiling for the tribe. Oh, the, oh the, the Indian Equity Fund. Yes. Or or the tourism. The tourism. Okay, because <laughs> we, we talked about a couple of them today, sorry. So the tourism, um, the maximum grant's 50000 This is the first time we've done this, so we're not sure how many applications we're going to get. But in that pool of money, there's only 118000 So if we get two tribes that apply for the max, it'll be two grants. Oh, and they have a uh, year to spend the money. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, just a question. You know, what if you get grants from all the tribes and and uh, uh, you get X amount of hours available? Uh, are you gonna, are you going to review the grants or? Yeah, we have a state review team that will come together and review all of the grants and look at the merits. You know, it'll be very, it'll, if we get all the tribes that apply, it would be very competitive. Uh, there's a cr uh, criteria that is out there on the guidelines that we would ask them to follow um, when they're applying for the dollars, and we'll just have to make a tough decision. Any other questions for Maria? Okay, if not, you guys are making my job easy. Uh, we'll go for a break until 10.45, so get in that 15-minute mile. <laughs>
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started again. Next on the agenda is the Big Sky Trust Fund and ARPA Workforce Training Grant. And we have Anne Marie Robinson from Department of Commerce with us this morning. Thank you very much. We'll wait for the PowerPoint. There you go. Thanks. Could you bounce this next time? So we're going to talk about the, our ARPA, um, which is the American Rescue Plan Workforce Training Grant Program. And I'm just going to call it ARPA WTG because I like acronyms. I'm with the government. So please advance. So if the purpose, advance please, is to provide grants to reimburse business for costs associated with providing skill-based training for new and existing full-time workers. And um, next, and the proposed training should lead to an increase in capacity, production, and or revenue to the business. So that's our focus on this program. There are lots of different um, training programs, but this is our focus on this program. So who can apply? Go ahead. So they can be for-profit, non-profit businesses. Um, they need to be physically located in Montana um, with eligible employees. Employees is a big deal. They need to be actual employees of them that are on, like, getting a, a wage uh, on their W-2, um, you know, withholding, those types of things. And um, they need to be registered um, and in good standing with the Secretary of State or with the tribal government. So um, what kind of skill-based training, because that's usually everybody asks, what, what can I apply for? And this could be in-house and or um, on-the-job training. So you could have somebody that you come into your business um, that needs to provide training. That could be like um, safety training. It could be... Um, a forklift training, any of those kind of training. Um, and then it could be subcontractors where you're having somebody come in and doing some lean training, um, which is um, um, for manufacturing. Um, we can also have you uh, travel to attend training, and that would be we could take for the direct cost, um, hotels, train, um, that would be uh, transportation, and um, food would be on a per diem basis. And we can do training and assessment and tax and testing. And the big one that we see a lot of is that if you have to maintain a certification, um, then we can also help with that maintaining that certification, which is um, very unique to our program. So the next one is how much you can apply for. We've kind of did um, had to figure out how to do an award, and so we based the award on the number of full-time and part, or excuse me, full-time new and existing employees that you're going to um, train. 
And for the limit, we set it at $3,000 um, for each of those. That is, and we'll talk about how that isn't the set amount that, for the training cost, but that's just to help us get what the award would be. Next. Oh, sorry, on that last one, there's um, it's up to 70 employees. So the program requirements, they do need to be full-time employees. We have to find that as working an average of 35 hours a week. And there's a wage requirement of 170% of Montana's minimum wage, which day um, minimum wage went up January 1st. Uh, it's $9.20 is minimum wage, and so ours is $15.64 an hour. And we do require a dollar-for-dollar dollar match. We'll take the wages while they're doing the training and or other capital investments in, the, um, in their business or match. The application, we're accepting them through the uh, ARPA website. Um, so it's arpa.mt.gov, and it's under the economic development component. Um, you do need to provide your secretary of state or tribal certification. Um, you do need to provide 12 months of profit and loss statements. Um, you need to provide, um, if you are, I assume most tribes are under the unemployment insurance for the state of Montana, and if not, then we'll have to um, figure out an alternative to you. That's the um, a listing of employees that are uh, covered under that insurance and their employment insurance. Um, you need to provide us a training plan because these grants we do, we're going to award them for one year. So we want to know what you're looking at doing for training for the next year. So unlike some of our other counterparts like the incumbent worker training program that you apply for each training opportunity, for us is JIT. We want you to give us a plan for the entire training for the year. And then a hiring plan if you're going to hire new employees. So if you're thinking of your businesses um, on there in your reservation, anyone that's looking to um, have that need for those training full-time, um, this would be a program that they may want to look at. Next. So the award process, um, again, applications are through the um, website. We review those applications. Um, they're presented to the advisory commission, and then they are approved by the governor. Seems like a long time, but um, that is our process. Um, so the award allocation is, um, is again, is allocated based on the number of new jobs you want to hire and the number and train and the number of existing jobs you want to train. You have that one year to implement it. And then once funds are allocated, you can use those funds however best you for those individual employees. So that $3,000 limit is just for the award. So if you have somebody that needs $1,000, somebody that needs $4,000, there's no problem with that because we really want you to have that flexibility. As long as the one employee receives more than 25% of the total allocation for that category. So um, this gives you the flexibility, um, especially if you have somebody that needs that extra training to be able to do that. Um, so there is a new hire incentive in this program. This is kind of really unique. Um, there is a $500 incentive if you hire people in the um, in one of the, those criteria that I will outline. The first one is a disabled person, and that would need a certification from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, a disabled veteran, so they usually have their certification. Um, you need to be Native American, and they have to provide their enrollment identification post-correctional facility, and the last one is if they have a gen that new job that they're creating is um, over the um, $51,000 a year or the twenty-four fifty-two. So they still have to be uh, full-time and, you know, employees, um, but those are the incentives, and it's paid out at the end. So they need to be able to create the job and train them, and then at the end we'll evaluate if they have um, met any of these criteria for this incentive. So kind of a unique one. Do you have any questions before I move to the next program? Yeah, Anna Marie, I have one question. You know, uh, uh, can we use these dollars to train some of our employees on customer service? We don't have this. The tribe can't apply directly, but if you have a business that wants to um, say, a grocery store that has a full-time that would like to do customer service, absolutely. That would be so far developed corporations on the reservation that would be eligible for for these 
dollars. Yes, right now nonprofits are eligible to apply directly to. Sean's uh, hand is up. Go ahead, Sean. Yes, sure. Um, it was stated that uh, individuals that are registered with the Secretary of State are they're registered under uh, the registration of a sovereign nation. But uh, one thing that we do need to consider is that uh, sometimes there might be registration, but there might not be a database within a sovereign nation to collect this information and to actually know that these are individual legal entities. And so one of the one of the problems that we're dealing with, I guess, with our individual businesses on Indian reservations is that the tribe cannot communicate this uh, legal entity to anybody because they don't have the document, even though they processed it. So the problem that that we were trying to find a solution for was to try to do an agreement with the Secretary of State where if they're registered under a sovereign nation and that information is collected through the Secretary of State utilizing their website and that's in the process. And I, I think that we've lost a little bit of traction in the past, uh, since the pandemic. Um, we need to get back on track on that so that we need to make sure that all our Indian businesses uh, have an opportunity for all these different uh, opportunities that are out there. So with that, uh, we need to maintain some kind of communication, uh, start to communicate with the Secretary of State to utilize that system. So Sean, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. Um, you're saying if a if a native owned business is registered with the tribes, they're not tracking like what, like if they're sole proprietor or LLC? Correct. And, and then, uh, so the, the problems that we're running into with a lot of tribal nations, especially our, our tribe, is that from administration to administration, the legal document, the entity that says that you're legal uh, entity under the sovereign nation that uh, they might lose that document. And then the requirements for a nonprofit communicating to the IRS and things like that, that information is not there. The audit information is not there. The articles incorporation is not there. So what the intent that uh, the originally that we originally were to move forward on was when um, Heather was here and um, Casey Lozar was here within the Commerce Department is to communicate and inform the Secretary of State utilizing their registration system for our entities. Even though if it's a legal entity under a tribe, utilizing that system, and at some point in time, the Secretary of State with their staff can communicate to uh, these uh, legal entities, the legal business entities or nonprofit entities that the, this and this quarter report is required, maybe an audit, articles and corporation, things like that. And it would be all in their file, like as if it was off reservation entity so that it's a legal entity and it's viable and it's there. And we were we were going to move on on this issue and try to eliminate this problem, but um, I think that everybody's moved on, and so we need to uh, bridge that gap and that problem. All right, thank you, Sean. And Ruth, has that been an issue when people are trying to apply for your grant as far as them being registered with the tribe? And oh, we haven't had one from the tribe yet. So, um, but definitely, if they were um, somebody that did not was not registered with Secretary of State and they were unable to get that type of documentation from the tribe, if they provide us with a contact, we'd be glad to reach out to the tribe to confirm with them that they um, are in fact enrolled with them. That would be we would definitely be willing to to um, have that as a workaround. Yeah, 
Okay, so are there any other questions? We can go ahead. All right, thank you so much. The next program I want to talk about is our Big Sky Economic Development Trust Fund Program. Um, this actually has two parts to it. One is planning and the other one is job creation. And next, yes, the purpose of this is to create good paying jobs, assist Montana businesses, promote economic development, and encourage workforce development. So I'm going to talk about the job side of it first. Um, so this one here is to reimburse basic sector businesses that um, with costs associated or expenses associated with creating full-time net new jobs. So we're paying on the growth of that business. We, um, they need to be full-time jobs, and the reimbursement is based on the location, and it's a one-time investment of either 5000 or 7500 Typically, um, Unless they're located outside of the major reservations, it's usually $7,500 because it's based on the poverty rate. Um, but a lot of them, um, if they were in the Billings area or let's say Missoula or any of those, a lot of times those are $5,000. And there is that wage requirement, again, 170% of Montana's minimum wage and a match requirement. Um, so how this works is that the local government or tribal government Sponsors an application on behalf of the assisted business. The assisted business needs to be, have a focus of that out-of-state sales or clients, so they have to have that um, bringing new money into the economy and it create at least one full-time job. We can, by statute, allow for the value of the ERISA benefits. Um, those are uh, our federal law, and if you were to look it up, it's really aligns itself with the union job. So the um, dollar equivalently for, um, say, medical insurance, um, dental, life, ADD, time off, we can use that in making the wage requirement as allowed in statute. Here is our poverty map, and you can see that um, most of the state now is um, in that poverty, and that is if they are greater than the um, state average. So um, anyone in the tan, dark tan or orange sheet, that would be the $7,500. And with that, they also have a reduced match requirement of um, one to two, dollar for dollar. And so the way that the program does is we have that minimum, that at 170% of Montana's minimum wage, but our pro a purpose of the program is to create good paying jobs. So even though you meet the minimum, we really want to make sure that we're reaching those higher wages. And so if you, um, if you come in with just the minimum wage, um, you may not receive the full award. We'll prorate it based on how far away you are from the county average wage. And we have this on our spread on our uh, website. So if you were to look at Bighorn County, um, they have quite a high wage of 2260 uh, um, Blaine, Let's use Blaine is 1530. So if you had a job that may pay more than 1564, but less than 17, then they would get a prorated award based on how far away those jobs are from that. If they're above that wage, then um, typically we've been trying to award the full amount. So here's some funded projects I thought would be interesting. We have Island Mountain Development Corporation. This is actually the office in the Billings area that's doing your um, payday loan. They were going to create 86 jobs, and they were awarded um, $404, $200. And so um, they're quite a ways into that. Um, the pandemic really hit them hard, um, but we are um, they're getting closer. I think they're in the 50 range. And then Rocky Mountain Twist, that's out of um, Romance. And they, we have done multiple grants with them, but this one here is where for 20 jobs, and they got $150,000, and they did create all 20 jobs. Um, they are the ones um, in Ronan, if you have not seen them, they make the bits for um, your Stanley drills and, and cobalt drills. And then the Big Sandy Meat Shop, um, which is a Highline Packing, that is actually, um, it's kind of deceiving, but that's out of Malta, and they're using... Um, the facility that uh, um, um, Fort Belknap had used for their slaughtering, and that's the facility that they're currently using uh, to um, do packing, and they were for 10 jobs. 
And since the conception of the program, we've provided over $32 million in job creation grants. So the next one we have is planning. And um, go ahead. So this one here, the way that we look at it is if you have assisted business or entity has a need to hire an independent third party to prepare a report that will help move their economic development project forward, there may be a way that we can help. Our highest priorities of our program is to assist basic sector companies that would be leading to job creation and high paying wage. So who can apply? Um, we have our certified regional development corporations. Um, there's uh, 10 of them across the state of Montana, um, strategically located, and they do regions. Um, and so they can apply directly to us um, on behalf of a project. Tribal governments can come in directly and as other um, local governments and other eligible economic development organizations, because there are parts of the state that are not covered under a CRDC. My fair paw would be one out of Haver, um, trying to think, uh, that would be Lake County, Community Mission West now. Yeah, so that would be who that could apply a project in your, in your area. So Anne-Marie, can our tribes for profit arms apply like SAE Development Corporation and uh, um, Island Mountain? They would, they would need to have be sponsored by either the CRDC or the local government, and both of them actually have come in. Um, SAE came in, um, I believe that was sponsored by um, Sweetgrass Development Corporation, and Island Mountain has actually came in under Bear Paw Development. And so here's our CRDC map in case um, you're not familiar with those programs. Those are our regional economic development organizations, a great resource um, for you. Some of them um, are overreaching with your NAVAs, but um, also they're um, a great resource to you. So here's some funded projects. Um, we did help with the All Nations Health Center with the preliminary architecture report out of um, Zula. Um, we actually actually and, and have helped the one here in Helena um, with um, the clinic there they have. We did Island Mountain Development Group. We've actually had kind of two different ones with them currently. They're looking at doing a, um, an assisted living facility in out of uh, Fort Belknap. And then the a recent one is they want to look at a greenhouse using some of the thermal under the, under the Little Rockies. And since the conception of the program has been $8 million. So, Again, um, we've had projects that have come in. I know um, we've done the a trail for CFK several years ago. They came in directly. Um, something of Rocky Boy, I think you came in one time directly. But a lot of those projects um, are using the CRDC um, just because then they don't have to manage the grant part of it. So here's our contacts. Um, Leanne is here as our division administrator. I'm the section manager, and then here's the staff assigned to the projects and um, our website. But I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Chair, uh, and I have a question. They, so, you know, being new to commerce and not, not and these programs have been around a while. So the last one that you talked about, um, what is the significance of having them come through one of the certified regional development courts? What's the reasoning for that? I think that's a choice that the, the projects have made. Um, I was thinking um, the Browning School, the nursing school, um, we actually helped with the architectural design. And again, they felt that it was easier to go through the CRDC in that area. Than, tr than trying to try manage the grant. Um, and so I think it has more to do with capacity. Um, but I know like the Crow came in directly for their bottled water project. Um, so there has been some that came in directly. Um, the one job creation where the tribe came in directly was the, um, the um, Little Shell came in for the, um, the Travertine when they were looking to do some mining in the Travertine area. Are there any questions out there in Zoom land? Okay, 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was an honor to come and give the presentation. Oh my gosh, we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> okay, go ahead if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning to everybody in the room and out there on Zoom land. My name is Renee Lemon, and I'm the administrator with Community MT which is a division that's under commerce. Um, I've only been in this role for six months, um, so I'm newer, but I've been in state government for about seven years as a planner. And before that, I worked at the local level as a community planner, so helping communities plan for community and economic development. <clears throat> and it's been kind of a challenge moving from that local level where I was living in communities and got to know people, knew the issues inside and out, to moving to that statewide perspective and thinking about, you know, how can we best provide resources to communities across the state um, and really invest in those high-impact projects. Um, and I'm excited about what our division is doing. We've got kind of a model um, and we're going to go through some programs, but this is kind of what's up on the screen, the three stages of how all of our programs are organized. And so the first stage is really that early engagement where we're going out to communities and we're meeting with folks and helping them develop a vision and identify those high-impact projects. And then we move into planning, where we try to narrow the focus and develop a roadmap for how to achieve those high-impact projects. And then finally is implementation. So as Anne Marie was talking about, we also have programs that will actually fund construction of projects, and we have staff to help um, communities execute on those projects. Um, and so. We're really excited to be here today, and we were so excited that we had several staff that wanted to come in and meet with you all. And so with me today, I've got Taylor Crowell, who is a program specialist, and an interesting tidbit about her background, she was an AmeriCorps volunteer before she came to Commerce, and she worked with AmeriCorps volunteers across the state helping communities. And then also here is Mackenzie Esteland, and she's also a program specialist. She works closely with Taylor, um, and she's really passionate about building capacity in communities. Uh, so we just want to thank you for inviting us to be here today. We think it's really important because historically we've had lower participation from tribes in our programs, and we want to work with you to try to increase that participation. Um, and so just as one example, we're going to be talking about our Montana Coal Endowment Program, which helps to fund infrastructure projects. And I queried our database, and since uh, 1993, we've had nine tribal governments apply and be funded for that program. And that doesn't include communities on reservations, um, but that just gives you a sense for that need to increase that participation. And so in the next 15 minutes or so, um, we thought it would be interesting to tell some stories and share examples of how communities have participated in our programs. And I wanted um, my colleagues to come because they're really the ones that are out on the ground helping communities. So I thought they could best express what that looks like to you. So Taylor and Mackenzie are going to start out with that early engagement piece. Um, and as they go, we do have a handout <coughs> that I saw was posted on the website. Does everybody have one in the room? Because I brought some extra copies if you don't. And it looks, it says Community MT on the top, and then it's got a bunch of tables. And these tables highlight four programs. Um, and so as my colleagues are, are talking about and telling stories 
and sharing examples, they're going to go over the highlights of these programs. And then you have this cheat sheet to take with you that talks about the basics, such as elig eligible applicants, eligible projects. And then also on the back um, is a list of all of our contact information. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Taylor. Thanks, Renee. Hopefully I have this button down, but let me know if I don't in Zoom land. Um, so yeah, Mackenzie and I are going to spend the first couple of minutes talking about early engagement. Um, and ideally, we really encourage communities to start working with our decision in this way, um, to get involved early in their visioning process. Um, and we like to think about this as the what. You know, what do you want your community to look like? Um, what do you want your community to be known for? Um, what do you want to attract into your community? What type of economic development projects are you interested in? Um, what other types of um, projects are you interested in? What's worked? What hasn't? Really the what before we get to the how, which is more of the planning and implementation. Um, and we recognize that we don't always have the opportunity to be involved early on in this process, but we think that it's really effective when we are um, because when we're involved in this early engagement, visioning what stage, we're able to make sure that all of the important stakeholders are at the table, um, that the community is tackling high impact projects that leads to further economic development or community development goals down the line, um, and that these high impact projects are being strategized in a way um, that layers different funding um, to leverage both public and private resources. So in our division, one of the main ways that we um, can focus work on early engagement is through the first program that we're going to talk about, which is the Montana Main Street program. Um, and it's the second program on your handout um, under CCAP. Um, Mackenzie and I are two staffers that work on the Montana Main Street program, along with a couple of other programs um, in our division. But the Montana Main Street program works with 35 member communities across the state to strengthen um, Main Streets, which we like to think of as the economic and kind of cultural core of a community. We're also the state coordinating program for um, Main Street America, so we're the state coordinating program for Montana. And Main Street America is a national um, nonprofit that's a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. They're really leading the charge on kind of Main Street revitalization across the country. So as the coordinating program, we play an important role with connecting these 35 member communities with kind of a national framework for how to revitalize your downtown and best practices that have been really flushed out at a national level. Can we bring those resources into communities um, in Montana? So along with all of that technical assistance, we provide an annual conference for our Main Street um, members every year. This year it's going to be in April in Billings. Um, and then we also provide small grants. So our grants range from $5,000 to $15,000. They require a 20% match, um, and they can be for both planning and implementation or construction projects. Um, and our membership um, cycle is open from October 1st to December 31st, and then our grant application cycle is usually in like November, or December each year. Um, and I just quickly pulled up our reinvestment statistics from our 35 member communities this morning. We had kind of a slow year in terms of reporting because of the pandemic and just um, capacity issues at the local level. But in our 35 member communities this past year, um, because of their Main Street efforts, there were 67 full-time equivalent jobs created. There were 36 new businesses that went into Main Street. And then their efforts leverage $9.4 million in public investments and $20.3 million in private investments. So that just kind of speaks to kind of the impact of this approach. Um, Hi, Us, did you have a question? I do, Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Um, so yesterday we had a tribal planners call and we were talking about beautification yeah. of our reservation communities. Um, and I know Cheryl's on the call and Velda's on the call with us today. Uh, and that 
one of the questions, I guess, you talk about this grant, five to $15,000, that 20% match, is that, um, can that be in kind, is that cash? Um, it's usually cash. Um, yes, it's usually cash. Um, but again, with a smaller grant like that, we haven't come on to many instances where it's an issue to come up with that in cash. And it can be other, sorry, it can be cash or other um, grant funds. So sometimes um, projects will come into the Montana Main Street program for some part of the project, and then they'll come into the tourism grant program downstairs in commerce or um, for a planning project, potentially Big Sky Trust Fund or CDBG planning. So we do work with communities to try to figure out a way to get to that match requirement and kind of layer funds or leverage other funds. Um, oftentimes, too, they um, reach out to private foundations like AARP here in Montana funds a lot of beautification projects like that. And can you give us examples of some of the beautification projects? So, like, for example, the town of Browning is now unincorporated. Yeah. And so it sounds like they would be eligible for this. Um, and Cheryl, you know, has some ideas of some beautification projects that they would like to do. So maybe examples would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of goes into my next bullet point. So um, in terms of membership, so our grant cycle is only open to member communities. That's an important um, point that we would want to highlight. But our membership is open to any community in Montana, so whether that's the city, town, or unincorporated place. Right now, Lincoln is a member community, and they're unincorporated. Um, and we have had a couple of kind of preliminary conversations with Browning, so we would be really interested in continuing that. Um, so, yeah, all communities in the state of Montana are open for membership. And then in terms of some example kind of beautification projects, um, this photo is us here in Round or in Roundup, um, and they've tackled a number of kind of beautification projects. They're working with AERP right now to install um, new bike racks and benches that have all of Roundup's logo and branding that they recently did on their main street. And then um, this photo is also us out there. This is a vacant lot that's at um, the corner of um, Highway 12 and Highway 87. And there's close to 500,000 um, cars that pass through Roundup every year. And so they're going to transform this vacant lot into a welcome plaza and a park. And they're um, going to have kind of like a kiosk where they talk about, you know, what can you do in Roundup? Again, they're thinking about how do we increase um, you know, we have all of these non-resident visitors that are passing through town, but how do we um, encourage them to spend time and spend their dollars in Roundup? And I'm sure maybe similar for Browning, right? You have all of um, that traffic, but how do you get people to stop? And so they're even thinking about, like, electronic or electric vehicle charging stations and maybe incorporating that into this welcome plaza. Um, so those are some of the um, kind of larger beautification projects that we've been involved in. Does that answer the question? It does. Thank you. And then as far as member communities, what do they have to be a member community and is there a charge? Yeah, there's no fee or no annual charge. Um, so for membership, um, we've seen the best success when there's a group of local stakeholders that are really involved at the local level. So that would include um, business owners, um, either municipal or tribal government representatives, volunteers. We're looking for some sort of kind of local commitment to this approach um, and someone to kind of lead the charge because there's only so many of us here on staff, and so we need to make sure um, that there's that energy at the local level. Um, and then, again, our application cycle is open every year from October 1st to December 31st for membership, and it's like six or seven questions. Um, application, and then, um, yeah, we're just looking for kind of a commitment to this approach, um, but there's no annual fee, um, and then again, it gets, us, it gets you access to this grant program, um, and then also all of our technical assistance and um, conference, you know, stuff like that. I would say, too, if you're interested in becoming a Montana Main Street member community, um, contact us. We typically like to have kind of a community meeting, so we'll either, pre-pandemic, uh, go out to the community, meet with the interested party, walk around the town, talk about project ideas, things like that, um, but we're happy to do that virtually as well. Um, but yeah, just please reach out to our staff. 
And so I'll tie into that now. We've talked about kind of the early stages pre-membership uh, to Montana Main Street. If you apply and become a member to the Montana Main Street community, um, we're kind of going to get out into your communities and help you develop a work plan. So those meetings and technical assistance can take place, like I said, in person, email, phone calls, virtual meetings. Um, but we really want to get out there and help our membership communities figure out what projects are going to be most impactful for them. And that can be a variety of project types and sizes. Um, you know, it's going to be stuff that is small projects, high impact, that can be accomplished easily. We're going to help with that. And those serve as kind of building momentum and catalyst projects for these big, harder to tackle projects. So we like to get in there and help kind of figure out that work plan initially. Um, this is very flexible. Like I said, not all projects fit all communities. Uh, projects that are going to create high impact jobs, going to redevelop buildings, like Taylor said, bring folks into the community and really get that economic activity going in the community. Those are what we're wanting to see and um, help your communities with. So I'm going to use the town of Thompson Falls as an example. Uh, they had a combination of projects that they wanted to tackle, such as parks, trails, um, everything from flower baskets to murals, uh, redevelopment of vacant buildings. This particular building in Thompson Falls is the Black Bear Inn. It was, it's a historic building. It was empty for more than 20 years. It is very prominent on their main street. Uh, again, this is a well-traveled highway, so if you're going up and down that route, you're seeing this focal point. And so for them, this was a big priority on how do we turn this almost block of our main street into an active space. Um, so they were thinking, do we want to do affordable housing? Do we want to bring businesses in? And how do we accomplish these things? How do we take this building and really serve it as a catalyst project for the rest of our downtown? And from that, you know, that's where our planning and implementation comes in, and our programs can really help move ideas and conceptualizations like this forward. And so to recap, Taylor is live piece. It's really what do we want to see in our communities? What do we want to do? And who's going to be at the table? And then the planning and implementation is moving that process forward. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cody. Richard has a question. Yeah, I had a question. I, I just wanted to wait until your presentation was over and you, might, have, you might come to it. But uh, right now, how many projects have you funded in the country? Just like uh, I know in Rocky Boy, we have no main street. So currently, we don't have any tribal government communities in main street. We would love to see that. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a main street. Think of it as community revitalization. So um, we're happy to view uh, any community. Let's take Lincoln, for example. They don't have a traditional main street core or historic district. They're a little bit spread out there on the highway. Um, but it's more about community revitalization as a whole. And so we, we're very flexible with that approach and want to help meet any community with their needs wherever they are. And I think that's the great thing about the Main Street approach is it does it, it's not a one size fits all. So it's very community independent. And every community is going to have a slightly different approach. They're going to have a different vision and different goals. And we want to help the community achieve that. Thanks for that question, Richard. Um, this is, that's a really good question. I was thinking about my hometown of Arley and We've had to work with um, Montana Department of Transportation several times just to get people to slow down when they go through the the town. I appreciate that question. Go ahead. So uh, sorry for my late arrival. I got your love with school here. I got lost getting here. So <laughs> <laughs> well, things have changed a little bit in the last 20 years. Uh, so my name is Cody Ferguson. I'm uh, the Community Planning Program Manager for the Department of Commerce. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about planning and some of the resources we have available. Um, so planning, uh, you know, what is planning? Planning is an essential process uh, to prepare for and um, respond to change, right? So our communities experience change, either rapid or even slow population growth. The population growth, the population decrease, economic change. Planning is a way to 
you know, look five, 10, 20 years out, imagine the shape of the community you want to live in and what you want to, what you want to protect, um, how you want to grow, and then to begin to put a process in place to um, move from that idea to implementation. Um, and so it's been such a first step in, in ensuring, you know, how we move from community vision to a community reality over time. Um, it's also essential in uh, preventing um, waste, making sure that we are planning projects out and budgeting for them to ensure the efficient use of uh, resources to invest in capital improvements um, in a way that makes the most sense that, um, quite frankly, you know, prevents these kind of like whole boondoggles that can happen in communities, uh, make sure everybody's on the same page and, and we're moving in the, in the same direction. Um, we have two uh, programs I'll talk about uh, specific to planning. Uh, the first is the Community Technical Assistance Program, and so I think that's included on your handout. And um, this really is kind of a um, it, it's exactly, you know, what the name says. We, we provide assistance um, on issues related to planning and community development uh, to communities um, as it's requested um, or when we see that there's a need and we can we can intervene. And that, community, that assistance can take a, a few different forms. So um, we can be responding to a request. You have a question specific to, um, you know, we have this issue related to a subdivision that's going in or related to housing um, how do we deal with this issue, right? What are the legal ways that we might um, have to put subdivision regulations in place, for instance? Um, or, um, you know, we need resources to do some planning for infrastructure. How do we how do we get there, right? Um, the other form that we can take um, is that we can actually, in communities that don't have capacity to do planning, we can actually assign um, consultants we work with. I think right now we assist on our retainer have Four consulting firms that deal in engineering and planning, and we can assign one of them um, to come and work with you directly um, to do preliminary planning uh, to help the community, um, you know, put together you know, public meetings and, and envision um, goals and objectives for how the community ought to move forward, and then move towards the process of going out for for grants um, and finding funding to to facilitate planning. Um, currently, we're doing that with Plains and Troy. We've done it with a handful of other communities experiencing change um, across the state. Um, Boulder's the one that's closest to here um, with, the, with the closure of the um, uh, Montana Development Center, um, but Coal Strip and out of the box. And, um, we're happy to, happy to offer, happy to, offer to any community. Okay, I feedback. Uh, to any community in the state of Montana um, and, and are eager to work with communities on the reservations and tribal governments. Um, the second, in this example of, of uh, assistance that we've been providing through the Community Technical Assistance Program has to do with the American Rescue Plan Act. So you guys are probably somewhat familiar um, all this funding that came in, both to tribal governments and to communities on reservations, um, and then also counties um, to pay for recovery from the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, and the part that we're associated with in community development is associated directly with uh, water and, and sewer, uh, water and wastewater infrastructure improvements. Um, and so actually, Marie and I started talking a couple months ago about trying to do outreach uh, to tribal governments that initially, the in the first round of, of the, the, the ARPA grants, uh, we have fairly low participation from um, tribal governments, um, and we've been able to increase that in this last round. Like we almost doubled the number of applications that came from reservations on communities and tribal governments. Um, and so, and we've had successful um, grant applications to come from and, and already be awarded to Fort Smith, Lodgegrass, uh, Crow Agency, Hot Springs, um, and we're hoping there'll be many more of those coming. Um, so once we move from planning, then we move into implementation. And um, we have two programs we'll talk about briefly with implementation. Another word for implementation is construction, right? So we do the planning, um, and then um, communities come in uh, to either the Montana Coal Endowment uh, Program, um, or they, they might come in for the project for Montana Historic Preservation and um, take funding for the construction phase. Yeah, Maria. Yeah. So before you move into implementation, if we go back to the Community Technical Assistance Program, mm -hmm. and it says participants, cities, towns, counties, tribal governments. So I'm thinking of, um, uh, for example, Crow Agency. 
and Plenty Doors Community Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. Um, they would be eligible for the technical assistance, for example? Yeah, with the community technical assistance program, CTAP, we don't, um, we actually don't really have any restrictions on who we can provide assistance to. And so if there were a development corporation or a nonprofit working with the community, um, and, you know, they were working together, we could, we could work with both of them. Um, if we were to assign a consultant, we would probably assign the consultant to a city or, a, or, a, or to a town or an incorporated town um, or the tribal government, um, but it could be in collaboration um, with a, a nonprofit or with a developer corp that was working with a community. Yeah, we actually have kind of maximum flexibility, I think, on how we can provide assistance through CTAP. Um, so the Montanical Endowment Program, this is a program that's funded through um, interest on the, the coal severance tax, the coal, the coal trust, and it provides money for um, water and wastewater uh, infrastructure improvements and also bridge improvements. Um, and uh, it's it's funded on a, a biennial cycle. So in the spring of or summer of even number years, remember this right? Uh, we take applications. The applications are considered, ranked, or reviewed, and then at the next legislative session, so in the in the winter or you know, January of um, an odd year, then those are presented to the legislature um, and the ranked and reviewed applicants that are recommended for funding. Um, applicants come in, they make their case for the legislature in some cases, the legislature considers them, and then they're, they're typically funded. Sometimes there's a little, the legislature changes things here and there a little bit, but that's how that cycle works. Um, the grants are up to $750,000 um, with a match, uh, but you can match um, money from a variety of sources to those projects. And so the one we have a picture of here, this is the Haver wastewater treatment um, upgrade. This is a large project, uh, about $10 million. It included $750,000 from the Montana Coal Endowment Program, um, along with funding from um, the Renewable Resource Grant Loan Program run through DNRC, I believe USDA Rural Development, um, and, and local funding as well. Um, so that's the Montana Coal Endowment Program. The other program is the Montana Historic Preservation Grant Program. This is state funded. It was created by the legislature in 2019. The funding comes from uh, the bed tax or, or tourist tax. Um, and then the legislature considers projects that are recommended by the department for funding. So these are projects where uh, we have an, an old building or a facility that has some historic um, character uh, value to it. The community wants to incorporate in its community revitalization or an economic development, um, the department, Montana Department of Commerce, works with the community on that project um, and then um, helps kind of bring it to um, the point where they can move on to construction, to, to renovation. Um, and the legislature considers the recommendations of the Department of Commerce and like the Montana Coal Endowment um, Program approves those. Um, in 2021, uh, there were 26 projects that were funded across the state. Um, in the inaugural cycle, there were 94 applications um, that were reviewed, and, and two of these were from tribal governments. And we would really love to see more tribal governments or more communities or reservations that these kind of projects apply for this program. Um, yeah. Question. So it says uh, um, brick and mortar. So I think like Chippewa Cree and Crow on some of their uh, some of their goals is to build new tribal offices. You guys still have that on your plan, right? To build a new tribal office. So in the long range plan. But something like that would be eligible for if it, if it was a historic building and and Taylor McKenzie would know more about exactly what the, the requirements are for the building. Um, does it have to be on the national or the state registry? No, it doesn't. So, so there's three kind of funding options. So we can fund historic sites, history museums, or historical societies. And so if it is a historical site, meaning it's a building that's 50 years older, 50 years or more old, um, and has some sort of historical importance to Montana, then it's eligible. If it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places or on a state or local registry that kind of adds to your claim of historical significance, but it doesn't have to be listed. So like a new construction 
of a non-historic building, unless it was for a history museum or a historical society, wouldn't be eligible. But if you were talking about renovating maybe historical property um, on one of the renovations or on one of the reservations and then having, um, you know, the tribal government move in, then that would be eligible. And if it weren't eligible, I would I would encourage um, you to contact us anyway. Anyway, and through CTAP, we could sit down and think about different funding options that might not be this one, but there could be some other options available. Um, so I'm thinking like at Crow Agency, they have their um, old mercantile store, and they've had some feasibility studies, and they're actually going to tear it down, and it's it's a it's an old building, but they're going to tear it down and build a new building. But if they chose not to tear it down, that might be eligible. Okay. Yeah, and there and there of course there you know are a lot of these potential buildings across the state, and some of them are um, some in some cases the better choice to own. I don't expect the community comes to that decision, uh, but this could be a good program for some of those historic buildings. Um, I guess we can talk. I can talk about briefly. I'm probably going over time. We did have one. Um, but a sort of preservation grant um, project that we were going to talk about. Um, the legislature granted fifty thousand six hundred dollars to CSKP for a new location for the Three Chiefs Culture Center. So that was um, funded in part with the Blunt and Historic uh, Preservation Grant, um, or at least the PAR, the, the Preliminary Architectural Report for the building was, along with the ADA compliance. Um, also, a, a well and security system were part of that. Um, so we have we have had some projects, but we would we'd love to see more projects. We don't have a time to keep Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, the last thing I was going to talk about was just outreach. Um, I mentioned before, you know, with the American Rescue Plan Act, with the, you know, the water and sewer program, um, you know, we tried to get intentional with outreach. Um, as, I, as I said, we did increase the number of applications that came from reservations on communities. Um, which was, I was really glad to see that. I think we, we had 11 in the first round, four that were awarded. We had 17 competitive and four minimum allocations, so 21 total in the second round. We, can, we expect to see more of those minimum allocation grants where they're applicable to come in. Uh, but we're also happy to work with um, tribal governments or communities and reservations to talk about what's ARPA eligible. If it's not the state ARPA program, what's eligible for funding through tribal ARPA funds or County ARPA funds that counties might have. Um, we worked closely with Bighorn County um, for how to work with the Crow Tribe um, to get some of the planning going for water and wastewater systems on Wyola, Pryor, um, one of the communities I was thinking of over there. Hi, this is the line. I'm sorry, I'm not raising my hand, but um, I have just a, a general question. Can ARPA dollars be used sure. for cash uh, for a match um, on? on either this type of grant or any grants that you know of. Can ARPA dollars, according to the US Treasury's uh, guidance, um, because you know it was slow to change, in your experience, has ARPA dollars been able to be used for, for match on projects? Um, so our, the ARPA luckily is fairly flexible in what can be used for match. And um, with some exceptions, our understanding is that for the most part, ARPA dollars can be used to match other other ARPA dollars. So if there's state travel fiscal recovery funds um, directly from Treasury, they can be used to match an ARPA competitive grant that's run through the state program, um, or it's used to match a minimum allocation grant application, say, from the county in which a reservation might partially reside or fully reside. Um, but we'd have to look at the specific the specific funding situation to know for sure. The one exception I think are economic development uh, agency grants, EDA grants. Um, ARPA dollars have had some trouble with that as far as matching those. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility. For the most part, ARPA we found has been able to match most other sources of funding, federal sources of funding, and state sources. Um, but we, we'd have to look at the specific projects in the budget, I think, to say for sure. I think that was Delina. Thanks, Delina, for the question. This is Maria Valandra. Um, so I think it gets confusing because there's federal dollars and then there's the federal dollars that have gone to the state. And so I think what I heard you just say is that the federal dollars that have gone to the state, the state 
they can be used as match. Yeah. The federal dollars, right? Yeah, and so it's all it's all federal. Yeah. But there's federal that goes directly to the tribes, and then also to incorporated cities, um, and towns and counties. And then there's the federal money that went to the state that's that's been divided into these grants. And um the way that it's been working and the way that we understand that it works is basically it's all federal money, it's all the same money, but it can be used to match against each other. So the state tribe or the state Sorry, the tribal local fiscal recovery funds, which come directly from the feds, the state is treating those exactly like local fiscal recovery funds that went directly from the feds to non-tribal entities, but then they're using to match against the state's administered water and sewer grant funds. That's from ARPA. So it's confusing. It's all the same. I still think it's overly confusing, but um, yeah, of course, I'm not the cool from it. Would that uh, you know, the tribes have a hard time coming up with a 25% match? So, uh, our funds that they receive can be used to match the state fund that are available. Is that my understanding of just what you said? So long as the so long as the project is eligible under ARPA, then those tribal ARPA funds could be used as a match for a project, but. For instance, for some of these other grant programs, um, so for Montana Coal Endowment Program, that would be the case. They, ARPA funds could be used for that. Um, I'm not sure with NHPG, but it would have to be an eligible. The project would have to be eligible for the thing to be used. And, and the tribes actually have a much wider list of, of eligible projects than non-tribal entities what ARPA money can be used for. So I, I think with that, I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, we talked a little bit about outreach. We're actually, you know, looking forward to um, working more with tribal governments, communities on reservations. Um, if you guys have ideas for how we can better um, work with you, we would love to hear them. And we are, you know, we're happy to schedule meetings. We're happy to do things online. But um, you know, we are we're a resource for you to use, and we would like to know how we can do it the best we can. So with that, I'll. Open it up. Okay, questions? Sean, did you have a question? Sure. Um, yeah, this uh and this is uh for the beautification program and outreaching and things like that. Um one thing I've noticed in uh Wyoming, the state of Wyoming with their tourism beautification programs and uh, partnering up with Indian tribes and things like that. And I've done a lot of uh, initiatives with Wyoming from a family level and uh, uh, other native events and things like that. And I think that we can take a look at what they are doing, what kind of initiatives they are doing and how they partnered up and uh, communicated and things like that. Because every little uh, town from the small ones all the way to the big ones, every single town is a tourist tourist trap. and um, you know, before, let's say Buffalo, it never had all those little shops. But now, if you go down that main street, there's all kinds of shops down that area. If you go to um, from Cheyenne to Gillette to every every place is a tourist trap. And not only that, they're stepping up on. Um, they're all communicating with the different uh, committees, uh, commissioners. Uh, the rodeo board directors and things like that. And I see where uh, they bring in native events and just my own personal experience was that uh, in Sheridan, Wyoming, uh, when their PRCA rodeo was gonna go by the wayside because they only had 30% capacity in, in the fan base, in the audience, uh, they stated that let's bring the native events back. And because of that, uh, now they have a parade, now they have a powwow, now they have an Indian relay. Uh, they have dancing and things like that. And because of that, now uh, it's sold out crowds for the rodeo. Not only that, uh, sold out for the hotel rooms. And um, I think uh, because of that, in Wyoming, in Sheridan, Wyoming, has the largest beer sales in the state. And so because of that, I think that uh, they have a multiplier type effect by partnering up with uh, native tribes and Indian tribes and uh, enrolled members to bring their activities. So they, they uh, 
from Cody, Wyoming to all these other places in Wyoming, I think that they've done uh, a good job bringing um, tourism and uh, attracting the outside dollar to their communities. And I'm wondering how we can move forward on that kind of initiative in the state of Montana with every single town that we have in the state of Montana. I'm gonna take a stab at this song. <laughs> First, what comes to mind for me is our regional feds um, project that we have going with the Native American Development Corporation out of Billings. You know, they've been working with all the, they've been having weekly meetings with all the tribes for when we're done, it'll be a total of five weeks, looking at past, current, future projects and then looking at what the commonalities are for each tribe. So for example, if all the tribes are interested in tourism, maybe that's um, gets implemented into our um, implementation strategy. So that's my first thought. Maria, did you have anything to add? Yeah, and actually yesterday we had a meeting, a regional feds meeting for um, the draft, the first draft that's coming out, and that's where we were talking about beautification because uh, many of the, the tribal communities um, want some sort of beautification project, so it's going to be in the action plan that comes. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's a great first start to kind of what Sean's talking about. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to do is I will uh, make sure that we invite you guys uh, to talk um, again to our tribal planners group um, and get maybe a little bit more specific. We meet with all of the tribal planners across the state monthly, and so we'll get you on that agenda to talk more specifics. Because I'm a believer that people need to hear things at least seven times before things sink in. So. Uh, we'll just keep talking about these things. And then I think Luke has his hand up. Go ahead, Luke. Oops, sorry if I have my hand up. I don't have it up. Go ahead, Richard. I thank you for your presentation. There's a, I know uh, in the past, I I represent the Chippewa Creek Tribe, and I like to know what programs the tribe is eligible to receive. And uh, it's through presentations like this that I'm able to get the information that I need. Uh, but uh, I don't want to stop there. Just on Department of Commerce, I want to know all the information from all the departments within within the state. What we're eligible and what uh, we have to do to receive those powers. Well, thank you all for this information. I took a lot of notes, and I'm so excited to go back home and uh, beautify my little town. And I have all kinds of projects in my head right now. <laughs> and if you look on the back page of the handout, there's other contact information. And I agree with Maria, we'll probably need to hear it again. Um, just for it all to sink in and um, once we can you know bring this back to our tribes and um, for everybody out there in, in the zoom world um, so thank you so much for your presentation today okay we will take a break for lunch and we'll see everyone back here at one o'clock. We will start with the effectiveness of the commission committee report first um, because some people have to leave and I think we have an action item and then we'll go through with the other reports from the commissioners. So have a good lunch everyone. Thank you. Okay, it's one o'clock. We'll um, reconvene our meeting. And I think Lee's going to start out with the uh, apple drawing. Right. Misty, 
cool. You are the winner. Woohoo! Yay! Yay! Okay. Perfect. So with that, um, thank you, President, for coming. <laughs> So with that, we'll go into the effectiveness of the commission committee report, and that is um, Chairman Gray and Mr. Cole. Misty, do you want to start or me too? Yeah, if you could go ahead and start. We did announce earlier that we were going to rearrange our agenda to um, accommodate, I think Ms. Stu's leaving early. So go ahead, Gerald. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to see if Misty wanted to say anything, if she's going to be leaving early. Hi, this is Cheryl Revis. Are you asking me to get started? Uh, no, uh, Misty, if she's okay. on. All right, well, I'll just go ahead and start. <clears throat> so um, I guess the first thing that we wanted to uh, mention in terms of the, the committee name, um, we were looking at wanting to change it um, from the effectiveness of the commission committee to uh, commission governance. Um, uh, Billy, do you wanna mention anything on this or Maria? We just thought it was a better name fit for this um, uh, commission, our committee, sorry. No. Gerald, I think um, when we went through that strategic planning process, uh, we um, were trying to um, <clears throat> essentially, how do I want to say that? <laughs> Make the commission stronger and making sure that, you know, we're getting engagement from our commission members. And so um, it was originally effectiveness of the commission, um, but we think it's better suited to be a governance committee rather than effectiveness. I'll just add on to that. Uh, you know, there's other, when you have other boards with uh, committees, they usually have a governance and nominating committee. And that's really what this committee is about. It's about nominations to the commission. It's about making sure that the, the meetings are effective um, and that there's engagement and that we're really moving the commission forward. And so that's why we want to do a name change. It just kind of didn't roll off the tongue very well when you say effectiveness of the commission committee. You know, so that, that's, that's where we're at. Okay, and then, so then also what we discussed is um, Billy had a couple of orientations for new commission members, but we're, we're not having any participation. <clears throat> so I think what we, we were trying to figure out is how we can get commissioners involved to, well, actually the new ones to actually go through the orientation to learn about what the, what the STED actually is about and, and how it operates and whatnot. So um, we're working, trying to come up with some ideas in that um, to get them to participate. Billy, how did yesterday's, um, I think it was yesterday, right? That you had a orientation? Sure, we did have orientation yesterday. Um, we did have one participant um, and um, that was from Fort Belknap. So we still have to get Fort Peck, Blackfeet and Northern Cheyenne. Okay, so all the <clears throat> the committee's work going to be working on that to try to get our new uh, committee members to participate. Our commissioners <laughs> getting this confused. Um, then also maybe um, I know Misty was going to talk to Crow. We still need a a nomination from Crow. I don't know where she's at on that, and maybe Sean might be able to help with that. I'm not sure if either of them want to 
say anything? Hi, Gerald. Uh, yes. Um, so I've reached out to the chairman and the Crow um, legal representation, Major Russell, um, a few times actually about a nomination. And so I'm just waiting to hear back. And I, I can definitely um, put on a little bit more pressure um, in the coming days and report back on that. Okay. Did you have anything you want to add, Misty, to the to our committee report? Um, not at the moment. Um, I think you've covered everything really, really well. Um, I I'm I know we've got got a couple of changes happening right now, but I I think it's good stuff. Yeah. And then and then the last uh, one of the last things is um, probably discussing um fy 23 calendar dates and i think um either billy or maria can can um add to that if they want yes um, we actually have the 2022 calendar um within the meeting packets i'm sorry that i didn't post it on the website um but again um Our next meeting is May 18th. Um, we need to discuss uh, the location or the venue. Um, our third quarter meeting is August 24th, and then our fourth quarter meeting is November 16th. So um, we want to uh, pull the commissioners to see if there's anybody who wants to volunteer for us to meet in their community. For the May meeting. Billy, what are those dates? Again? Just add. Go ahead, Misty. I, I was just asking Billy um, what those dates were again. 518. Sorry about that. Uh, May 18th, August 24th, and November 16th. Thank you. So Gerald and Misty, if I could add, uh, our last, our meeting in November was held in Great Falls, this one in Helena. We were thinking about holding the May meeting in Billings, but if, if the commission wants us to hold it in their community, now would be the time to volunteer your, your uh, community and help us get that planned uh, for the May meeting. Um, if we don't have any volunteers, then we're probably going to uh, be in Billings. Oh, well, sounds like yeah, <laughs> Billings. It is. Okay. Yes. I'm doing. Well, I was just going to comment that, you know, it would be nice. We've never been to have her. That be a consideration or a tribal community itself? Actually, we only have a one hotel at the casino. And, uh, we could probably find some accommodations and have her. I'm not too enthusiastic about it. I thought. Hey Billy, I, I don't think Haver is a bad idea. And there are there's the um, Best Western, there's one downtown-ish by the gas station, and then there's another one toward Walmart. And both of them have really nice conference facilities. And you know, that would be sort of a really great proximity to Rocky Boys and um, Fort Belknap. 
and kind of a straight shot down the high line for Fort Peck. So I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Uh, um, I think that Haver is a good suggestion as well. Um, just at, at Fort Belknap itself, we probably could do something down the road in the future, but we probably want to call, uh, collaborate with like the college, you know, to use uh, an auditorium or something or some type of a venue. But yeah, I like the idea of Haver. Hi, this is Cheryl from the Blackfeet Tribe. I don't know if you're expecting to hear from all of us on the decision for the meeting, but Blackfeet is also a straight shot on the High Line, and it isn't, you know, difficult to get there either. What do you think, Cheryl? I think uh, let's do Havard. Sounds like that'll work for everybody. Hey, Gerald, did you have any time to, to think about the six, how we're going to measure the success of the committee? Uh, no, I think. Um, um misty and i probably should get together and visit about that and then we can um loop you guys back in because we do need we do need some kind of measurement and um to be honest misty and i haven't had time to to connect to talk about that and see and bring bring it forth to the rest of the um commission Okay, thank you, Joe. I think that I think that's all we had, unless Misty had anything else. I don't so, think uh, I, I'm good. Gerald and Misty, we it's actually not on this agenda, but um but it falls under the governance governance committee, which is, um, you know, of course, nominations and appointments and those kind of things. And so right now we have the issue that um, uh, our elected chairwoman of the STED commission, Shelly Fiant, is resigning from STED. And so um, I think Shelly wanted to say a little bit about that. And then we, after that, we need to uh, nominate a new chairperson and vote. And then I think what makes sense is then that new chairperson would take over the rest of the meeting. So, um, uh, Shelly, did you want to say just a couple things? Sure. Thank you, Maria. So um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and read my letter to Governor Gianforte. <laughs> it's dated today. Dear Governor Gianforte, please accept my letter of resignation as your appointee to the State Tribal Economic Development Commission as the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribal Representative. I have served two terms in this position and my current term was set to expire June 2023. However, I was not re-elected to the CSKT Tribal Council in December 2021 and as such, the present council does not want me to represent CSKT in this government-to-government -government capacity. Thank you for the opportunity to do this work. Respectfully, Shelly Fyatt. So with that, um, the tribal council has made um, nominations through a resolution to replace me, but the governor can't take action on it until I submit my resignation. So there you have it. Um, so now I guess we can open up the 
floor for nominations for chair of the said commission. If I may, first, Go ahead. Shelley, I, I, um, on behalf of my office and the governor's office, I just want to thank you so much for your faithful service to this committee, for to this commission, and and to your people. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to work with you and get to know you. Um, I personally, and you know this, have admired a lot of the initiatives that you've taken um, with your government. And uh, for me, this is a sad day. And, uh, but, I, but I hope you know that you do leave a legacy behind um, that benefits us all. And thank you so, so much. Um, with that said, I'm, I'm just gonna just keep this moving along. And, and I would like to um, nominate um, Chairman Gray. Um, to fill um, the chairperson seat. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pete. Uh, so we John. have a nomination. I have Chairman a second. Gray. Go ahead. I have a second on that. For the nomination of uh, Daryl Gray. Okay, we have a second by Sean. Uh, one quick note, I was going to say, uh, uh, Shelly, I was going to say that um, I sure appreciate all the effort and the years that you uh, dedicated your professional life to the State Tribal Economic Development Commission in your leadership as a, a chairwoman at SKC. And I know that uh, there's a lot of, uh, in a lot of times uh, in this, uh, Tribal government, a lot of times things change and things like that, but I know that uh, there's a big and bright path and wishes and blessings are out there for you in your new endeavors and things like that. And uh, I know that uh, essentially uh, you and me, we've been from, from college all the way on up, uh, raised together, uh, been through ceremonies together and I know your family and things like that. Uh, your late dad and all that and i uh, know that uh there's a big bright uh future in front of you however path whatever you decide to do in life that uh, from the state tribal economic development commission and from myself that i know that uh there's blessings out there for you i know that uh, sometimes the, in this uh government tribal government they throw us curveballs it's hard to handle hard to realize and we kind of wonder why that happens, but nevertheless, I know that the creator is looking out for you and I know that uh, uh, there's uh, better things out there at this point in time. I sure appreciate your effort and, uh, and it's outstanding legacy that you left for the State Tribal Economic Development Commission. Thank you, Sean. And Chairman Gray, you again, Misty. Um, it was a very difficult decision. This is one thing that you know, my heart was really in um, for the betterment of all the tribal nations um, located in Montana. But, you know, for CSKT to um, to be involved in this TED commission, I think it's best that I step down and have the new um, newly elected council members participate. So, um, yeah, I have... Um, plans to move on. I think it's part of the greater plan for me. And I just really enjoyed working with you all in doing this work. I think our uh, strategic planning process really helped lay out um, the path forward for the said commission. And I, I'll continue to stay as involved as I can, especially in the um, upcoming community meeting, which I'll report on in the partnerships committee. So um, thank you all. I'll, I'll miss um, these meetings and just working with you all. So we have a nomination and a second. Are there any other nominations? Not. Go ahead, Mike Richard. Oh, Madam Chair, since there is a uh, only one nomination. I move that nomination to be closed. And, uh, 
as Chairman Grave, he elected as chairman by acclamation since there is no opposition. We have a motion to close the, epic, or the nominations and um, proclaim Gerald as the new chair by acclamation. Second. Okay. Have a second by Scott. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Okay. Congratulations, Sherman Gray. And I will turn the meeting over to you. <laughs> well, thank you, Shelley. That was um uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to do this. Uh, I have been involved with this dead for for quite some time, not as long as Sean or Richard, though. Um, so I've got some big shoes to follow as well as you, Shelley. I do want to say I really appreciate um, your participation um, in this dead and all you've done. Um, it was a really, um, for us, the little shell uh, could call on you at any time and, and get a response and support from CSKT and yourself. And we really do appreciate that, um, you know, from the bottom of our hearts, uh, you'll for surely be missed. Um, and with that, I really do appreciate everybody, um, everybody's support. So I, I, I guess I'm um, surprised to me, uh, I can move on in the agenda. So, I don't know where we're at now. <laughs> Billy? Yeah, I, I do. Um, so, we're, Billy, can you tell us where we're at on the agenda now that we moved uh, the, this committee forward? Do we go back to the assessment committee or funding committee? Can you hear me, Maria? Hello. Well, this is Cheryl and I can hear you. Uh, Maria's looks like she's on mute. I don't know where Billy is. So, yeah, Gerald, if you want to just go forward, I mean, I'm next on the assessment committee. If you want me to just get started. Yeah, Cheryl, why don't you go ahead? I don't okay. Know. I don't know if they can hear me, so. Yeah, all right. Well, okay, so the assessment committee, the BBR decennial report update. Okay, so at the last state tribal relations committee, the decennial report was on the agenda and Maria Valandra did present it. Uh, where we're at and where we want to go. And she also presented the um, statute language, the um, legislative intent and progress overview. And then the other 
items that were presented was uh, information that that we have collected in the past for the for the previous BBR report, I believe. I don't know if it was called a BBR report, tell you the truth, but the Yellow Row report that you know was a report that showed what all tribes have um, collectively, um, I guess you'd say, um, as far as revenue uh, provided in the state of Montana, jobs as well. And so um, the tribal information was gathered by the audit clearing house. And that is just only some or partial information that was required. We still need to have more information. And then right now everything else is on hold um, just because there has not been any money identified to move forward and get an update. Um, the sources that are needed, um, in addition to just the federal clearinghouse information that tribes are all required to submit, um, is state money, earned income money from their own tribal entities, business entities, um, and federal funds that are not in the audits and private funding. There are a lot of private partnerships that also happen. And so those still need to be collected. The consensus at the meeting was that yes, we do need this updated. It is a valuable report. It represents all tribes and how much tribes contribute to the economic, um, I guess you huh? Sorry, this is Adam Schaefer. I apologize for interrupting. Uh, Maria just said that they can't hear in the room, and so they asked us to pause if we oh. can figure that out. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll see if I can get any update from. Okay. I think all of us online can hear each other. Okay, but yeah, there's a misconnection there. Can hear us there in the room. If you can hear us, I just joined. We can't. This is Cheryl. I can hear you. You're echoing, but I can hear you. I hear you too. I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Yep. We're just, we're just working on it right now. And uh, so with that, I'm here to hear them. No. Cheryl. Adam, can you try to talk? Somebody? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear yes, us? I can hear you. They can hear you. We can't. Okay, we're having some audio difficulties. Stay tuned. Richard. Yeah, we just can't hear them. 
something is done. Yeah, it's one of the computers is picking up our voices without us doing push to talk. I'm on, I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Mm -hmm. okay, that's good. Can you hear us now? Yeah, everyone online, we can hear and see each other, but we just can't, they must not be able to hear us. This is Delina, I can hear you. Okay. Says they're going to restart the call, everyone online. If you, if you, okay. could, if you could see the chat room. There we go. All right, so who's got a good joke? No, just kidding. Can you hear us now, Billy? Hey, all right. Got a thumbs up. All right, Cheryl, you want to keep going? <laughs> okay. Um, just really a quick recap. <laughs> um, what I had said was that um, at the at the last state tribal relations committee, the decennial report was on the agenda, and Maria Valandra did report for on behalf of of us, and I was also at the meeting. What um, she had provided was um, statute language. She went over that. And then um, the intention was to update, well, is, I shouldn't say was, sorry. The intention is to update the most recent report and fill in a 10 year gap in the data regarding the economic contributions of Indian reservations in Montana. And that's so we could have an accurate and comprehensive and detailed information and objective assessment of economic conditions for each reservation. Um, meetings were held with STEDS, STRIC, BBR in 2021 to request the data needed from each tribe and to discuss the delays in progress due to COVID. So several tribes, I don't mind is one of them that is shut down because of COVID, not open to the public. And so um, it had just really created some delays in getting information. Um, what information has been collected and is still needed with data sources was the federal data was requested um, in June of 2021 by BBER. Um, and that was through the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, the um, 
and uh, they what they got from that was only the federal funding expenditures. So there's other data that's lacking that we still need to collect, and that's the federal, the state, the earned income from uh, tribes that have corporations or you know land leases, oil leases, just their earned income, and then um, the fiduciary income that comes in. Just to really show, you know, that we are a big contributor to the state of Montana as well, and what money comes in, what jobs are created. Right now, everything is on hold because we don't have all that information. But it was a consensus that the um, report is needed to be updated. It has to be updated because it's a worthwhile report to not only the tribes but to all members of the state of Montana that feel there's they you know would like to see this report that have an interest in knowing more of what we contribute. Um, data sources that need uh, just to give you a little bit of idea from reservations, the data sources that were needed um, to complete this report was the tribal population, the land size, the key communities in each reservation, um, and then nearby key communities that you know are border towns that also contribute, we contribute to their, their economies and um, the ranking of revenues by type. The required support for the legislative um, intent is one, the activity to clarify the decennial report language. We need to clarify why the report is needed. We need one year, we need to decide on one year or 10 years that really still is a, a gray area unless I miss something, uh, Maria or Billy could uh, update us. And then um, we need to identify the appropriate adequate dollars needed to complete the update. The people that were involved in this is to, uh, the BBR, and we still need to decide if they're going to do it or if we're going to contract out or if we're going to just identify people at each reservation um, to collect this information. That's still another um, unidentified piece of information we need. And finally, it was around the budget was it would take about 400,000 to do all eight tribes. That's something maybe Maria could let us know about if that was if she feels that like that was still a mark for um, a, a comprehensive report to be completed with all the information that's needed to really justify what the tribes do contribute to the state of Montana. There are gaps beyond the budget tribes, and this is not only for tribes, but everywhere with the state government, with the federal government, we're still dealing with a pandemic and our capacity is at a, um, it's shrinking, you know, our human resource capacity. We don't have a lot of, of people at work, like I had mentioned. We've got people that are moving to other jobs. We've got people that haven't lost funding because of this pandemic and have to just, you know, bow out. And it, and it really makes it difficult because we need, you know, those people and, and we need those jobs. But the capacity shortage for collecting data is, is a realization that we've come to understand that it's going to take longer than we, you know, had hoped to get information um, to everybody on this uh, report, on this um, decennial report. So I guess to answer your final question, how will we measure the success of the committee? It'll be to get that report completed, the updated report and the money to um, create this report and the um, identify the consultants or contractors that will prepare the report and work with the pro the tribal um, governments. So that's pretty much all I have. And if anybody wants to fill in the blanks of or gaps that I didn't cover, we could um, answer questions. Thanks. Thanks, hey, Cheryl. I will. Um... Uh, this is Misty. Um, and I, I've been pretty involved with these conversations um, since last January, um, so over a year. And, and my encouragement suggestion for the committee would be um, to not make this a measure of success simply because there's so many moving parts. Um, and most importantly, this, this is going to take a legislative change. And so that success wouldn't even be able to be measured until 2023. Um, and so I, and so I, you know, I'm just in my experience from the conversations that we've had up until now, um, this is going to be sort of not impossible by any means, but I think it is going to be um, a rather monumental task 
um, with a, with a many, many, many steps. Thanks, Misty. Yeah, Cheryl, I think in that um, in the assessment committee, that probably needs to be put on the next agenda as far as the measures of success, so we can kind of discuss that a little more. Um, but what I wanted to add to what Cheryl said is that kind of the next step is uh, Pat McCracken, who is the uh, uh, the represent or what is his title? The staffer, yeah, the legislative staffer for the State Travel Relations Committee is supposed to, uh, I think, Misty, myself, um, uh, maybe Mary Craigel from Commerce, and there's supposed to be two legislators from STRIC that are supposed to get together and talk about next steps for the decennial report. Um, so that the next time strict meets and that said meets, uh, we should have a, a plan of action. Um, but we do know if we want this report, either way, if this report is summarized, like I brought forth an Idaho report, um, that's not as detailed as the Montana contributions report, but it still took hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the data. So either way, it's the data collection that costs the cost, and that's the expense. Um, but whether or not the report is as detailed as it has been in the past, those kind of decisions need to be made, as well as where is the funding for the report going to come from. Do the commissioners have any uh, questions about the economic contributions report? This is Delina. I have a question uh, for Cheryl. So um, is there any way that I can find out what specifically, what specific data that Fort Belknap does, does and does not have so that um, I can make sure that, you know, like our council and our administration understands the sharing of the data, especially when it gets into the financial realm, but these are like audit is public on the clearinghouse, so I get that. But um, just so that we can kind of let them get behind it so that we can make sure that like our financial consultants um, and other folks, our planners, et cetera, can be able to collect the data because is it 10 year data? Is it one year data? Um, because, um, you know, we can, we can kind of, so that we can kind of make a plan to assist with, you know, getting that data to the to the collector, I guess, if you will, so that th that could get compiled in a timely manner on our end. Anyway, thanks. Okay, thank you. That's a that's a good question. And at this point, all I could really tell you is that just the federal funding expenditures that are provided in the audit clearinghouse is what is available. I believe that's what uh, the BBR had collected. To date, so other information we need from Fort Belknap, Blackfeet, Crow, other tribes, CSKT, would be information that you have that you had just mentioned. You know, information that was earned, earned income that you received, um, any kind of state funding that you received, or I, I don't know if oh, I guess I should clarify, ask for clarification. Are you wanting to know what funding we're getting and how we're spending it? Um, Oh, no, I'm in just terms wondering. of jobs. Oh, I, I'm just wondering what kind of data that you need from us specifically, and then so that we can work on getting it for you. That's all. Okay. If I so, if I if I can just jump in again really quick. Um, I feel like uh, Delaney, your questions are really good, but they're super premature, and so I'll just take a couple minutes and explain to everybody um, from my experience where where we're at with this. So um, the the legislation um, supported and passed for the de decennial report um, was uh, two sessions ago. 
And in the last session, um, it's been coming up, um, you know, when is this going to get done? And the bottom line is the, the original legislation language is very murky. Um, it's, it's not easy to determine exactly what the, the time period is. Um, is, it the, is it the last 10 years? Do we start collecting that data now going forward? And, and so these are questions that we're working with strict to hopefully clean up. In the original legislation um, that Maria has very helpfully alluded to, um, that original legislation also only allocated $48,000 to this study, where we have discovered over the last couple of years that the original yellow robe study cost about, and correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, about $300,000. And with inflation and the effort that would need to be put in, um, in the, for a new study, we're we're probably guessing that to be closer to four hundred thousand. And so one of one of the reasons this is an ongoing conversation is because one, the language is uh, the language is 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 confusing. Bottom line, the language is confusing. And two, um, there just simply isn't enough money to conduct this study, even if we wanted to. And so. Um, all of this would take a legislative change in the next, in the 2020, um, the 2023 session. And so we're at, at the very least, if we can convince, and I, I you know, if we can convince um, and work with the next legislative session to get those two asks passed, we're at the very least a year and a half out from getting started on this study. Um, and if you have any other questions, please reach out to me or Maria, um, but that's that's where we're at. And I, I hope that's kind of helpful. Sure, thanks. So again, this is Cheryl. Um, I just wanted to say that the data source is needed for every year is from the federal, the, B, the BIA, the IHS, Social Security, HUD, impact aid to school districts, competitive grants received by agencies and nonprofits within the reservation. Through the state, it would be the school districts, you know, Montana DP, HHS, TANF. This, this is the kind of information we're looking for. Uh, the earned income through lease revenue, tribally owned enterprises, investments, trust income, received by tribal members for use of their land and or, it, or, and or interest payments related to treaty obligations and settlements. And then the fiduciary income is income from assets held by the entity um, in a trust capacity. And then various dollars, you know, that includes small sums of pass-through dollars. Does that help answer the question for you too, in terms of what you wanted to know what we're asking for? Yeah, no, that, that's helpful, Cheryl. Um, this is the line I, I have read the Yellow Road report um, and I've worked with Yellow, um, Eleanor, you know, before. Um, and, you know, uh, it is a it's, a, it's a decent report, but it's just so outdated and I get it. Um, but yeah, no, um, I just, I like data and I just kind of wanted to know. And, and I have yeah. read it, but to kind of do refresh, trying to, you know, duck and dive and figure out what's to the benefit of the tribes you know, how can we go ahead and, you know, fund such an effort? And then how can we navigate with, you know, um, you know, kind of coming out with a good perspective that's in the best interest of tribal economic development too, you know, not just, you know, feeding tons of information to the Montana state legislature with the, with the tribes feeling a little bit squirrely about having to share all that financial information, but for a good purpose, you know, that we can get behind. So, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Okay. And I agree with you. I mean, we, we're not doing this just to please, you know, the uh, a certain entity. We're we're doing this for ourselves. You know, this should be a, a tool that's used for tribes to be able to leverage, to show that we have, you know, a, a stake in the game, that we do have money coming in, and that um, you know we work hard to bring in a lot of those oil leases, and. Um, the state and it uh, does benefit from it. So that's what we want through taxes. And so that's just some of the stuff that we want to do was show, you know, what that we are a player, we, we should be at the table, but 
it, it appears sometimes that they some people just don't see that. And so you're right. This isn't to benefit just the state of Montana legislators or anybody. This is to benefit ourselves too, and to use it as a tool that we could help just provide uh, to start new partnerships, um, keep partnerships. But economic development, you know, uh, needs people that want to invest. Need to know that we, you know, also have money that um, is available, if you will. Thanks. I'm sorry, I should have said money. I, I mean assets, yeah, because we're always looking for grants. So we obviously don't have money, but we have assets, you know, whether that be natural resources, human resources, and different types of other possible infrastructures. <laughs> Thanks. Cheryl, Cheryl I think, I think you have to. Can you hear me? Oh, what I was going to express is that. Uh, what we are saying that the eight tribes in the state of Montana, that we are, we are a major factor in economic, in the economics of the state of Montana, that we contribute to the state's economy, and we are a major player, and that's what we're, that's what we're contributing to the economy by putting these, these funding dollars together and uh, stating that uh, here's our impact to the economy. And uh, when we first did this, and this is a little bit of history, is that um, there was uh, the TV, um, uh, different uh, radio, stop, radio stations were saying that this information was false. And they wanted us to get on the get on a radio broadcast and state, you know, they wanted to grill us on where this money came from and everything like that. But we stated that we put an official report out there stating that this funding is our official audit from our federally recognized tribes. And this is how much income we generate, whether it's trust income, whether it's federal income, things like that. And um, they were trying to dispute this total impact funding amount. I think it was over a billion or so at that point in time, but now it's probably over 10 billion at this point in time, if we ever uh, hammer that out. So that's the intent of this. And it's the language is in the, the law of the State Tribal Economic Development Commission that was drafted and approved into law. Thank you for that, Sean, clarification. Uh, we better get Sue Taylor on next, and I apologize. We're running out of time at the two o'clock break, but um, again, there was technical difficulties. Okay. okay. Maria, did you want to add something first? I know, Gerald, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, um, Sue, you want to go ahead and present? Certainly, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sue Taylor. I'm with the Native American Development Corporation. We've been working on developing a statewide SEDS document in cooperation with uh, Maria's office and with the commission. So what we did initially is we collected the, the SEDS documents that each of you had as a tribe. We sent them to a third party evaluation team and they came up with some common threads. And that's what we're gonna do. It's a very brief presentation, but I wanna reiterate that this is findings from the third party, and this is not yet incorporating the information that we gathered from you over the last few weeks during interviews that we had. So just keep that in mind as you, as you uh, see this. So we'll go there, we'll go there, we'll go here. No, doesn't like that. All right. Um, these were the top eight primary goals that the third party evaluator came up with. And these are goals that they gathered from your SEDS documents, things that were pretty prevalent in your, um, your goals and in the projects that you were working towards. So um, rather than read these word for word, and I will ask Billy to send this out to you. Um, Billy, I did have two updates to this. Uh, I just added the third party language up on top. So these are the broad categories that we're gonna use as the basis for the action plan for the statewide SEDS. 
And I do believe that each of you are going to be able to find projects that are priorities for you that would fit under one of these eight categories. But we're going to be gathering input from you and working through that um, starting next week. Next week, we're having a series of three meetings, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday. You should have received invitations to those. The content of those three meetings are going to be very similar. Uh, but we wanted to give you an option of which day was most convenient for you. So that are, those are the top primary goals. And I, I think that they really captured a lot of the essence of what we also heard in the interviews. Um, the next is just a brief summary on the demographics, talking about the reservations. Most reservations are rural and consist of small towns. You have younger trending populations. Uh, we've seen that from all of the data that we've gathered as well. Poverty rates are higher. And then your largest employment sectors, that second bullet point uh, where it says public administration, that would also include government, working for the tribal government. Um, and then strengths. I, I know that these are very important strengths. They're still pretty broad based, but um, you can look at your abundance of natural resources, you have tribal colleges, you have many tribally owned enterprises, and there are improving relationships each and every year between tribal, local, state, and federal government. Uh, you definitely have an active and interest in, and an active and interested in improving infrastructure and a pride and willingness to display your heritage and history. Weaknesses that were found from uh, the, this compilation of your SEDs include lack of private sector. Uh, this both means your business uh, sector is uh, could use some boosting and then private sector support in terms of money. Um, drug, alcohol, and domestic abuse are a large concern. You do have housing shortages across the board. Uh, there is a complicated trust land process, which negatively impacts real estate, as well as abilities for individuals to get commercial lending. Um, lack of workers, we see this across the state, including um, in Indian country. And then your tribal political systems um, are sometimes seen as a weakness. There are opportunities, including um, recognition and utilization of major highways. Uh, spur major private and small business growth with the right support, immense potential for ag, agriculture uh, endeavors, as well as animal husbandry, mining, forestry, and other natural resource-based industries. Uh, interest in energy resource diversification, and I think you all expressed that too during the weekly interviews. Then there's a, a couple of others listed on this slide, and again, I don't really want to read, read all the words to you. The threats are seen as young and skilled people leaving the reservation. Uh, job security and pay may not always be competitive. Climate change is impacting your livability and your landscape, as well as protection for your natural resources. Those are some things that are very important to, to each of the tribes. Um, tribal and federal policies can be confusing to navigate as we've seen on this call. Um, and then you'll see a few others here that were listed as threats. They might have been worded slightly different in each of your SEDs, but they can all fit underneath these general threats. And then there are some considerations and recommendations. Again, these are the ones that come from the third party analysis. Those include private sector development, tourism development, economic access and equity, intertribal investments, climate change, and workforce. Uh, with that, I'd like to pause, put another plug in for next week's meetings and see if uh, I'd be happy to field any questions that you have regarding this. Any questions for Sue? One quick comment, uh, Chairman Gray. Yep, go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, within these uh, meetings that we've been having and compiling all the SEDs and everything like that, I think that uh, 
what we, the eight tribes, need to do is uh, take a priority on our SEDS document because it's very important. And I think that sometimes, uh, sometimes the executive government, legislative government, and the community don't take a great emphasis, importance on uh, the SEDS document. And the reason I'm stating this is that um, when the federal stimulus came down during uh, Barack Obama administration, they sent uh, information to the executive branches of all Indian tribes across the state, across the state, and not only that, uh, across uh, Indian country. And uh, they stated, uh, we want to have all your SEDS documents, your updated SEDS documents, and ship them into Washington, D.C. And at that point in time, we had a meeting here at the State Tribal Economic Development Commission, and we discussed the importance of this. But I think a lot of times our tribal leadership overlooked the SEDS, but at that time they were, they were allocating um, billions of dollars to Indian country for stimulus. And so based on that, they wanted shovel ready uh, initiatives in the Indian country so that they can allocate funds. And they wanted to look at these documents and see where we stood, what level, what procedure, what step we were at, and they were moving forward to allocate funds. And so that's what they did. And so a lot of times during that administration, funds came from the federal agency to the state of Montana and allocated to the Indian tribes on behalf of these initiatives. So I believe that Indian tribes need to put a place an importance on this because if let's say uh, President Biden decides that he wants to move forward on shovel ready projects like they did before in the past, that we would be ready and prepared. Go ahead, back to you, Greg. Okay, thanks, Sean. That was a good comment. Anyone else? Chairman, yeah. Chairman Gray, I have a question for uh, Railbird. Go ahead, Maria. Uh, so you're, Sean, you're recommending, like you're saying, the tribes need to get involved. And yes, I think we all would agree with that. But it's the question, you know, this regional says document, um, it will be taken back to tribal council so that they know what it says and um, can have some input into prioritization when we move into phase two of implementation. But just so you know that. And, um, you know, if you have other ideas and suggestions on how they can get more involved, just please uh, let us know. I think one uh, moving forward with the uh, tribal resolutions and communicating the importance and emphasis on the tribal SEDS document. A lot of times, uh, I think what we do as executive leadership uh, and we have our program managers of the SEDS document, we have them manage it, uh, do the requirement and write the information out. But a lot of times from the leadership to the program manager, a lot of times there's a lot of disconnect and there's a, there's a lot of gaps. And I think that at this point, we could try to uh, fill those gaps and make that communication a little bit stronger. And if there's uh, earmarked funds or if the federal government wants to earmark, uh, let's say infrastructure on Indian reservations. And if there's documents out there within a SEDS document that says, you know, all the bridges on the Indian tribes are in bad disrepair, uh, we need to allocate funds to it and things like that. Then we have the documentation ready and prepared to provide these sets of documents to the federal government. And then we could get an earmark allocation for that and move in that direction. Chairman Gray, can I make another comment? Yes, you bet. Sean, I think that those are all good points, and, and um, I'm not sure if we're going to be butting up when we start the implementation phase, if we're going to be against some timelines for, you know, writing grants, but I do, I do agree with you that, like, once this document's in place, that there should be a visit to the tribal councils 
presenting this document, what it's about, what it's for, and then ask for a tribal resolution. And that tribal, you know, supporting the regional feds, and then that tribal resolution can be put in any grants that are, are going to be, uh, you know, written going forward. And, you know, just a reminder that instead, under our original statute, one of our, our um, that's why we have a committee under funding, because one of SED's responsibilities is to help the tribe find funding. So this fits within the, the statute. And um, Sue, do you want to make any comments to that? I, I've just been listening and writing notes as fast and furious as I can. I agree. Um, I, I agree that it is needed and that those resolutions definitely will be part of what we want to submit before we send this into EDA for their consideration. Um, that is a commitment from each of the tribes that they recognize and support this statewide document. And that's going to be very critical to leverage the financial resources that will be available to you in the future. One more quick note. Um, during that, uh, the, the stimulus monies that were allocated during the uh, Barack Obama administration, if there was a statewide tribal SEDS document that had stated that uh, fiber optics on Indian reservations were lacking in, ter in terms of uh, having this type of technology, and we were all in unison as a tribe stating this, then we might have uh, received that stimulus money of $1 billion to do a co-op and have ownership of the fiber optics throughout the eight reservations. But at that point in time, uh, each and every tribe said, yes, we have that problem. And yes, we're deficient in that uh, techn technological uh, infrastructure. But um, we didn't have the documentation and information on hand in unison as Indian tribes. So if we had this type of information and we were all in agreement, that this was a deficiency, we could have communicated this to Washington DC to receive those funds. But because of that, because of not having these types of documents, then uh, I think it was uh, at our disadvantage at that point in time. Yes, doing something like this and coming together in agreement, and we know that we know that it'll take some back and forth. We we absolutely acknowledge that, but it it would be a strong leverage point for you. Uh, just exactly what Mr. Realbert is saying, that it will give you access. It will open some financial doors, and we need to take into account that due diligence work that has to happen before you have a project that's shovel ready. Um, and I know that uh, Cheryl spoke about that multiple times. So we know there's a lot of possibilities. We know there's a lot of uses for this. And NADC is very pleased to be able to provide what we've done so far and look forward to presenting the draft to you next week. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Um, so if it's okay with the commissioners, uh, we, we want to just keep moving on. We have a couple more committee reports. Um, and with that, I think we'll have um, Shelly with uh, partnership committee up next. You ready, Shelly? Okay, thank you. Yep. So um, as part of our strategic planning process, um, we decided that in addition to our quarterly STED commission meetings, we would have community meetings on each of the reservations in between our quarterlies. And um, everyone wanted to come to the Flathead first, and so we have scheduled the CSKT community meeting in Polson at Quetuckbook Resort on March 21st. Um, the commission will pay for one representative from each tribe and one um, or one of the commissioners for that. Um, the, we just need RSVPs um, to Billy and uh, she can send out that 
uh, invitation letter. We didn't, I don't think we sent it out to the actual commissioners yet. But basically, the purpose of that is to um, bring our key partners and alliances together to network and inform and um, create those long term partnerships with organizational entities with similar missions. So we'll start at 8.30 with Continental Breakfast. We'll have welcomes, introductions. Uh, we'll talk about the purpose of the meeting, what is STED. We'll highlight two of our Indian Equity Fund recipients on the Flathead. One is a longtime business owner, Steve Lozar, who owns Total Screen Design. And then one is a new recipient last year, Steve Dupuy, who um, is building a sea store across from the tribal Blue Bay campground on the east shore of Flathead Lake. And then Velda and Janet from our economic development office will um, talk about the local tribal business planning grant projects. And then we'll have the breakout sessions. We have four um, breakout sessions scheduled, one on tourism, one on housing, one on infrastructure, and one on land use and natural resources. And in those breakout sessions, we'll talk about current projects. Uh, we'll talk about opportunities to work together. And then our next steps will be um, to form alliances, partnerships with each um, effort going forward. We'll have lunch, we'll have a breakout report, and then closing remarks. And um, so far, I think we have about 50 RSVPs, Billy reports. Um, we've invited the Ronan and Polson Chamber of Commerce members, uh, Glacier Country Tourism Commission, RSVP this morning with nine um, members. We also have invited the Lake County Commissioners. I believe there's eight legislators that represent um, constituents on the Flathead Indian Reservation, the Polson Mayor, the City Manager, different economic development folks um, in Polson, and then with Mission West Community Development Partners, and then CSKT staff, affiliate, affiliates, and corporations. Um, this is the first meeting of its kind, and um, I guess how we'll measure our success is by the attendance at this meeting and also the outcome of this meeting is to form a Flathead Reservation Alliance to further economic development strategies to benefit the local communities. So that's how we'll measure, um, I guess, this partnerships committee is, you know, this is the first of its kind, so um, we would look for a volunteer to host the next um, community meeting in between uh, May and August STED Commission meeting. So that's what I have to report if there's any questions. Chairman Gray, I have a question. Yeah. Um, the, the measurements of success, can you just make sure that Billy gets those so we can add those into the plan? Yeah, that would be great. Also, this, this is pretty exciting. Right, you know, uh, again, during our strategic plan, looking back, back at the original statute and the intent of the SED, is to form partnerships with tribal and non-tribal entities that have the same mission, which is economic development across the state. And so we feel like um, having this community meeting and and look at you know 50 some people have RSVP'd already. I mean that's you know this will be a great start to just forming and developing and uh, the partnerships that are needed. Um, with the CSKP and um, all the others on the Flathead that are working towards the same goals. So we really appreciate your efforts in putting this together, Shelley, and 
Um, of course, we know that you will be at the meeting on, in March. You are a tribal member, and so that'll be great to have you there. So thanks again. Okay, thank you. A couple of other um, key partners that I forgot to mention. One is Eagle Bank, and they are one of the banks that do the Native American collateral support. Um, so they'll be one of the people at the table, or they're one of the invitees. I'll have to make sure they're will be there. And then also um, Salish Kootenai College and the R. Lee um, Community Development Corporation. So those are a few of the people I forgot to mention that will will be there. Chairman Gray, uh, we probably would like to have uh, one of the other commissioners, um, you know, volunteer there to do a community meeting next. And and I think we can negotiate like what the time frame of that is. But <clears throat> uh, during this meeting, we'd really like somebody else to. Uh, to host a meeting in their community. Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I really, I think this is a great thing. I'd like to reiterate what you said, Maria. I mean, having one of these, it's all about partnerships and building those um, within Indian country and, and those around us too. So uh, really looking forward to this. Um, anyone want to volunteer their community next? All right, I guess we will leave that on the table. <laughs> uh, Chairman Gray, yeah. we have we have Blackfeet, Crow, and Fort Belknap on the call, and so I'm not sure if we need to volunteer one of you, but um, I think you know we're going to have this model from CSKP, um, and of course Billy and I are here to help. So it's not like we're just leaving you out there on your own. Um, uh, and remember, the intent is to build partnerships. So, and we, you know, we can have it when it works for you. We just, we want to continue this momentum. Chairman Gray, this is Delina. Can I make a comment? Yes, you bet. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, uh, so for Belknap Indian community, um, we're very interested, of course. Um, we're just, you know, not necessarily quite prepared, but for sure we'd like to have a, a more detailed discussion, perhaps one-on-one -on -one or something, or like a separate discussion of some logistical uh, planning so that, you know, we can make sure that all the key stakeholders are there. Um, we do have a council strategic plan that we do annually with our tribal council. Um, we're in the midst of um, gearing up for an update on that. Um, <clears throat> after March and um, we do strive to uh, include our community as well as our organizational partners, all the employers on the reservation, as well as you know, our, just our general population. Because after all, we, we, we serve the community and that's, that's who our government serves. So they're at the top of the food chain. Um, so well, we'd certainly be interested, um, but not, not so much as to raise a hand for the very next, but for, sur for sure, We'd like to get up to speed. This is my first Stead Commission meeting for several, several, uh, a couple of years. And so, you know, I'd like to catch up to speed and have a, a very detailed discussion on some planning for, for that. So we're interested and we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Maria? Hi. Oh, this is Cheryl. I just wanted to say I'm kind of in the same boat as her. I'm not prepared right now to be the very next one. Um, I'm short staffed here in my office and boy, Shelly has um, a great plan for what they're going to provide, you know, for her first meeting. And you really need to have a, a well-developed plan, you know, to, to present with. So we're not ready for the next one, but we'll, you know, offer it down the road. Uh, 
Chairman Gray. Um, yeah, so just wanted to make a comment to uh, Delina. We definitely can, can talk offline. And then, Cheryl, we're going to mark you after Fort Belknap, and we'll put that in our notes. <laughs> uh, so um, with that, uh, the, we'll be in contact, like, with the new members, especially the new commission, because with Shelly going off, we do need uh, uh, somebody to champion the Partnerships Committee. Um, and we'll talk about that kind of stuff offline. So just a heads up. And and uh, yeah, that's so that's all I had, Chairman Gray. Okay. All right. So I guess we can move on with the last committee report, and that would be um, the funding committee. Maria, were you going to handle that one? That's when we were offline, and maybe you guys couldn't hear us because oh. um, Billy reported on that. Oh, she already did? Yes, she did. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we're good. She can do a, a, a quick recap. Yeah, because I don't think any of us online heard, heard it. <laughs> Cheryl was going at the same time. So. Okay. That was fabulous. <laughs> so, uh, Chairman Gray, uh, our champion for our funding committee is Brian Hadson from uh, your tribe. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't join us. So I'm just briefly going to report out for him. So I recently uh, was able to get set up with a like, of delivery platform to start sharing state and federal grants. And that's how I'm going to use that information uh, to disseminate. And then um, we are in the funding committee. We are going to be planning an economic development forum. Um, we're thinking sometime in the summer, but we may have to rethink that with all the celebrations going on. Um, but that is going to be um, a topic of conversation. And um, in our packets, which you don't have, uh, is a is a short list of grant writers uh, that we are collecting and sharing with our um, tribal planning. Uh, folks and economic development um, departments. So that's my report. Okay, that was short and sweet. Thank you, Billy. Do we, what else do we have? Do we have anything else, Billy or Maria, on the agenda? Might be getting done early. We're good. All right. Well, I guess we can then, um, well, I guess we'll see everyone in May. And um, if, if nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn? Can I make that motion? This is Shelley. Okay. I'll second it. Second by Sean. Any comments? I just wanted to tell Shelly, I thank you too for your service and I'm going to miss you. You're such a smart lady there and I know good things will happen for you. Um, hopefully you'll still be able to reach out to us individually and keep us informed of the good things that are happening. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, yeah, my next venture is going to be a food truck. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Well, I hope we get to see it at the Grizz game, Shelly. Yes. Go Grizz. Yeah, right on. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you.